What's going on, you guys? It's your boys. It's the crew. It's the gang at OddsHQ and Odds.com. I'm your host, Bleed, and I got my gang with me, the whole crew this week. Yeah, it's UFC 258. Kamara Usman Gilbert Burns kicking it off in the main event for the gold, the welterweight strap. Let's throw it around and let's kick it into gear. Guru, what's up? How you been? Yeah, what's up, man? Uh, glad to be back. I was listening to the show last week. You guys were talking about the beard, man. I was thinking I was going to wake up the next day, you know, have like a Khabib beard, have the best beard on the panel. But <laughs> obviously, you guys see it didn't happen. So, but yeah, I'm glad to be back, man. It's pay-per-view tomorrow. So, you know, couldn't be more excited to be here. Absolutely. M-M-A-L-O-T-N. What up, man? I'm I'm great, dude. I'm glad to have Guru back in the fold here. The band is back together, like I tweeted out a little bit earlier. Always fun when we get to break down a pay-per-view card. And it may not seem like a pay-per-view card on, on paper, but I think some of these fights will actually deliver, and hopefully we still have a good time watching these fights and hopefully cash in some tickets. So hopefully uh, we can get some good picks out of all of us today, and I'm really looking forward to breaking down the card with you guys. No doubt. And Cody Saftik, what's up? Yeah, something tells me that the UFC was probably like, Kamaru Usman will give you $10 for every pay-per-view you sell, and then went and proceed to give him no casting support. <laughs> he has no co-main event. He has pretty much nothing else going up for him in the main card. Gaslam Heinrich is going to be cool. And then they lose Jim Miller and Bobby Green today. So this is why we do the show on the Friday. We get as much info as we can. We see the weigh-ins, and we give you these last takes. So happy to be here and happy to get into it. No doubt. Well, I'll tell you what, let's kick it to my man Guru to kick it off tonight. We got Jillian Robertson going up against Miranda Maverick. Guru, who you got? Yeah, this fight to me, it's uh, it's an interesting fight because it's two girls that, you know, I feel like Jillian, maybe her hype is kind of dimming a little bit or people are kind of thinking she maybe plateaued. But both these girls, you know, had hype at one point. Maverick has probably the more hype now, I would say. But I mean, obviously, Jillian is uh, way more experienced than you've seen. She's fought a lot better girls and She's a specialist. I mean, we all know she's trying to, you know, hit that single leg, get it to the ground. She has gotten better with her striking and her movement, you know, jabbing and moving, you know, kind of controlling distance a little bit better, but she's not really a good striker. Maverick is definitely going to have the striking advantage, but I don't necessarily think Maverick is like a super powerful, great striker. I mean, she is, uh, you know, in and out with her movement. She has kind of that, you know, karate, taekwondo type of style, throws a lot of kicks, but I don't think she has a lot of power in her hands. I kind of think that that fight with Jojua, I mean, she was getting pieced up for uh, the majority of that first round before she started turning it up. And she did uh, land those nice elbows, which, you know, could uh, pay dividends against uh, Robertson. But I do feel like, I mean, we've seen um, her as well in other fights, like when she fought Deanna Bennett, she did get taken down, lost that fight the first time they fought. Even when she fought uh, Deanna Bennett the second time, you could argue she was losing 2018, the first two rounds she did come back at that rear naked choke in the third round. Pearl Gonzalez was able to take down um, her and, you know, control her a little bit. So I definitely feel like Robertson has a big path to victory because I think if she takes down Miranda Maverick, I don't think Maverick is going to get up. So, I mean, I think it's a close fight. I know it's uh, the last fight on Jillian Robertson's contract. She's never lost two fights in a row. And I feel like she's just fought the better competition. So I'm going to go with uh, Robertson. I think she's going to be able to – hit the takedowns, either win two of the three rounds or maybe find the back at a submission because we have seen Maverick expose her back before. But Maverick is young. She is improving a lot. So, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if she came in here and looked, uh, you know, leveled up again and a lot better than um, Jillian is. But just from, you know, what I'm seeing here, I, I like the underdog spot. I think it's a close fight. So I'm going to go with uh, Robertson. Sounds good. Lock of the night. Who you got? Yeah, whenever it's a Jillian Robertson fight, you guys will find me on the under two and a half. And this fight is no different here, right? I think that both girls have finishing capabilities. Miranda Maverick, I think, is more live for a TKO than a sub here. But even with Jillian Robertson here, I mean, she's always uh, a submission over position type of girl where she's going for subs and giving up solid positions that she, that she has, whether it's a full mount or whether she has the back. She just wants that submission. She wants to take home your arm. She wants to take home your neck, whatever it may be. And I think that's just a detriment to her at certain times. Now, she could be successful in landing the submission here, a submission here against Miranda Maverick, but I think that the strength of Maverick will give her a little bit too, man, too much issues. And the longer this fight does stay on the feet, like there's no secret about it. Jillian Robertson just wants to get this fight to the ground, right? So she like 
not even half commits to striking, like a quarter commits to striking where it's just like, I'm just going to throw out these flashing shots, get you thinking about like, oh, hey, look at this jab. And then I'm going to try to dive for your legs or something like that. Right. But it's pretty obvious if anybody watches any of her fights. So I think Miranda will be um, aware of that. Hopefully she's able to showcase more of her improving Muay Thai, just as we saw, saw in her last fight against Liana Jojua. And man, those elbows, absolutely vicious, especially the one that caught her up, uh, that caught up uh, Liana Jojua, which eventually ended up stopping that fight. So the longer this stays on the feet, obviously I favor Maverick. The more this hits the ground, I, I do favor Robertson to a certain extent. But again, when she does overextend herself, I think Miranda will take advantage of those positions. We could see a, maybe a ground and pound finish where we see Robertson just, you know, stalled up in a, in a very awkward position up against the cage or something. Uh, so I do like Maverick. I think she gets the TKO finish. But the play for me on this spot is going to be the under two and a half, which is still currently around that plus 155-ish range. And that's 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 my jam. That's, that's the spot that I'm going to be on. So I'll go with Maverick to win via TKO. Nice. Cody Saftik, who do you like in this matchup? Yeah, both girls got a lot of merit. I think I'm going to lean Maverick just because I want to buy into the fact that 23 years old, she's young. She's clearly getting better all of her fights. And one good thing about her is that she goes out there and she tests herself every time out. I mean, the Joshua fights low level, but throughout her career, I mean, even her losses are to a solid level of competition. She fought in the Invicta one night tournament. She has a willingness to, you know, get in there and, Fighting in one-night terms is not exactly a good career move. Uh, you gain a whole lot of experience, but, like, you know, possible injuries and bad matchups, and you're not able to put full camera prepare. But, like, that just shows, like, a, the, the willingness. However, you see her on the scales today, it's like this girl's very, very good shape, very strong physically. I think she poses a lot of problems for Jillian Robertson. But Guru nailed it when he mentioned that she's got porous takedown defense. You look at a lot of these fights, and Miranda Maverick is getting taken down. Did did Jojua take her down? No, she didn't even attempt it. And obviously, she's not going to. She's a striker. Uh, she's a striker herself. But with Maverick, it's like in the past, she has been giving up these takedowns. And when you're spending more time than not trying to get back up off your back, you're just giving up points to the opposition. Jillian Robertson, that's the path of victory for her. If she gets the fight to the ground, she's got very good top pressure, top control. Locke and I spoke about it last night. She's one of these girls that'll give up a good position to go for the submission. That's a bad move. You know, she shouldn't She shouldn't be so eager and aggressive to get these arm bars, get these rear naked chokes that she's willing to just give up a good position and allow her opponent to eventually work her way back up. But if she does end up on top of Miranda Maverick, she's going to give her all types of fits. It's whether or not you believe her wrestling is good enough. And honestly, when you watch the tape on it, Jillian Robertson is just not a great wrestler. So even if she do goes out there and takes Ma Maverick down in the first round, can I rely on her to do that for rounds two and three? Whereas I think Maverick's got a great gas tank and she's going to keep pushing the entire time. So, you know, this is probably going to be a relatively close competitive decision. I'm just thinking Maverick's going to edge out two of these three rounds. I know Locke talked about the fact that he's got the under two and a half as well. And uh, my boy, Al, in the comment section, bringing up a good stat as well, that uh, Jillian Robertson unders is seven and two. However, a lot of that is just low-level opposition. Like her first five or six fights in the UFC, she's finishing everybody. And then you notice in her last three in particular, the Courtney Casey fight is only 20 seconds away from going the distance. And then furthermore, uh, her last two fights, now that she's fighting a little bit of a better level, the submission might not stick. You know, she's showing a little bit of an increased durability since her loss to Macy Barber. So she's not getting finished. She's not scoring the finish. They're going the distance. So I think I'm just going to take this one to go the distance and not necessarily have a, a strong push on who's going to win. Although I will side with Mavericks being the pick. Good stuff. I'm on Maverick. I, you know, Locke, you, you brought up the, the best point, man, and I think this fight's going to come down to strength, you know. I think some of the fight's going to end up, you know, playing outstanding, right? But I do feel like whoever wins this fight is going to go out there and be the stronger, more competent grappler, and it's going to be the, the chick that we see in the dominant top position, I think. And for my money, I just feel like that's going to be Maverick, you know. I felt like she was the stronger fighter. When you look at Jillian Robertson, you know, a lot of her shortcomings in fights, I feel like, are to just – uh, bigger, which I'm not necessarily necessarily saying Maverick's bigger. I think Robertson has the slightly larger frame, but I do think Maverick is the more muscled and especially the weigh-ins today look to be in tremendous shape, looks really good. And I think Maverick's just going to go out there when it comes to these 50-50 positions. I think Maverick's going to be the one that pushes through, uh, spends the majority of the fight on top. I think she's got a decent chance to finish this fight. Like you said, our boy Al talking about a uh, fight not going the distance for Robertson, man, that's the side to be on. But um. <clears throat> I got Maverick in this one. Not sure how it's going to play out, but uh, my pick is Maverick. So we are second fight of the night. This one's going to be good, I think. We got Gabe Green going up against Philip Rowe. MMA LOTN. Can you get us going here? Yeah, this is a tough one for me to, to really pick out because, first of all, we've only seen Gabe Green in the UFC once. 
He took that fight on super short notice against uh, Daniel Rodriguez. And that was a fight where it primarily just took place on the feet, which is probably not where he's the most comfortable, to be honest. The guy likes his jiu-jitsu. The leg, he likes uh, the wrestling, and he likes to get the fight to the ground and try to get that game going. But he just couldn't go do it against a guy like uh, Daniel Rodriguez. Now, with Phil Rowe, I've heard from inside sources that he does have a gym somewhere in West Philadelphia. And when he's not in the gym... He's on the playground shooting some hoops and stuff, right? But the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, this guy, I don't understand why he's not with that whole that gimmick a little bit more. You know what I mean? Like the, I'm not sure if you guys saw the way in face offs this morning. You see the guy going out there and Kate Green trying to give him the the whole the psh, uh, handshake, and he's like, "Fuck you! What are you trying to do to me?" Right? So I, I don't. I, I wish he would play up to a little bit more, especially given how close and identical the guy looks to him. But in terms of like his fighting skill, I feel like he's still a little bit green. And I, no pun intended there as well, right? Like the guy is very uncomfortable on the feet that it looks like unless he goes out there and hurts his opponent right it's like in the leon shabazian fight we see him get hurt on the feet get dropped does a good job in terms of uh keeping his durability up it gets back into the fight rocks and hurts leon shabazian in the second round and then goes out there and finishes him in the third round but it's been a long time since we've seen him do that. Like that was August of 2019. So we're talking about a year and a half since the last time we saw this guy actually go out there and perform. Now, Gabe Green, on the other hand, has been a little bit more active. Obviously, has been inside the UFC cage. And even though the arena might not be uh, different, where both fights did take place in the apex for Gabe Green and for Phil Rowe last time around, seeing the UFC on your gloves and seeing the all those sponsors and everything on the on the cage and not just the Dana White contender series thing, right? That's gotta have a little bit more of a shock value to 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 Phil to Phil Rowe, right? Another thing that's very interesting about this fight is the the metrics in terms of their 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 height and their reach. I believe it's about a five inch height advantage for uh Phil Rowe and not to mention a six and a half reach advantage as well. So I think that this fight is uh, you know, the longer it's on the feet, the more it probably will favor Phil. But I do think we'll see Gabe actually be successful in like closing the distance, pushing this up against the gates, getting this to the ground, maybe pulling off a submission himself too. But I feel like there's just so much rawness between both of these guys. That's going to be a little bit more of a wild and chaotic fight. So this is another spot where I'm looking like maybe the under two and a half is a spot. It's around that minus 120 range. That's the only spot I'd feel comfortable in terms of betting here, as I don't feel like I have the best grip on what either of these guys bring to the table. And not to mention, and how they match up with each other. I will favor Gabe. I think he's going to be the one that gets it down, possibly pulls off a submission. And, um, you know, working at Fusion XL for Phil Rowe, you got guys like Jock Ray Souza and somebody else we're going to be talking about later on this card in uh, Rodolfo Vieira. Those are great training partners for him for, for him to really round out his skill, but he's really got to get it going, right? The guy is like 31 years old at this point in time. He made his uh, pro MMA debut in 2014, and now here we are in 2021, seven years later, and he's only racked up nine fights. That's not the type of resume that you want to have coming into the UFC and being so low volume when it comes to actually being active inside the cage. So I'll go with the Gabe Green side of things. Uh, not the most confident of picks there, but I do think he eventually gets the fight to the ground and pulls off a submission of some sort. Uh, but the under two and a half is probably the strongest lean that I have in this fight. Good stuff. Cody Saftik, who you got? Yeah, again, it's another fight that I'm pretty indifferent to. I think you can make a strong argument for, for both sides. With Philip Rowe, it comes down to the seven inch reach advantage. You know, I mean, the guy's six foot three at this weight class. He's a big boy, big boy all around. And I think when you watch Gabe Green against Daniel Rodriguez, one of the things he struggles with is Rodriguez is just the bigger, stronger, taller man, beats him to the punch, rocks him a couple times, and then is, you know, able to coast on that. But ultimately, Daniel Rodriguez is a top flight competition. And when you look at Gabe Green, he's fought much, much better guys. At least the reach show scene fighters he was beating were you know bellator veterans he did compete on bellator he's got a loss to jalen turner who went on to make the ufc uh he's got a win over chris padilla that's all prior to coming to the ufc eventually he himself also has the win over leon shabazian in which he got it done in the first round it, it's like he fought some legitimate guys and then debuted against a legit guy I, there's something you can take away from that with roe it's like you really have to buy into the narrative you have to buy into the narrative that's like oh he should have made a lot of improvements at Fusion XL over the last year. He should be able to use the seven inch reach advantage to his advantage, but should, should, should is just like not enough. At least with green, there's a way more that you can look at and see what he's done. So uh, again, I can see flip flopping on either side of this last night, Locke and I discussed it and I, I fell on road just based on yeah that, that reach advantage. I think if he does similar things to what Rodriguez did with it, he should just be able to stay on the outside chip away. 
But I rewatched all the tape again last night and again today. I mean, you're always trying to see what what new angles you can take from it. And he's just extremely hittable. And you see that in the Leo Shabazian fight where he gets dropped in the first round. He gets beat up pretty good in the first round, but he rallies in the second and third. Gabe Green has a similar outing against Daniel Rodriguez where he's getting slapped silly, but, but he keeps rallying with it. But it does look like he's got probably better output than Philip Rowe. It looks like he packs a bit of a better punch than Philip Rowe. And Philip Rowe is really awkward, right? Like he's one of these guys that'll throw a sidekick. He's, he's kind of lacks a day's luck at times. He's hard to get a read on. And I think that's why he's able to go out there and beat a lot of low level guys in the first round. You know, they, they can't get a beat on him and all of a sudden he finishes them. But with Gabe Green, I mean, he shows that he's super durable. And and I think that if he does what Leo Shabazzian did in that first round, only he doesn't gas out in the second and the third, then he'll just continually put it on him. And, I don't know. Like they got it nearly matches a 50 50 fight. I would like to say it's a dog or pass. Rose, the slight dog. So maybe you go in the road direction. But listen, guys, this is a pretty low level. F this We're talking about it being a low level card for a pay per view, but this is a low level fight on said low level card. So uh, I wouldn't invest a ton on it either side. It's hard to really feel good about it. Yeah, makes sense. Guru, who are you taking? Yeah, I mean, I agree with these guys. I don't think you can have like a super strong read on either side. I mean, when you look at Phil Rowe's record, kind of like Cody was saying, I mean, really padded record. He's only really fought a couple guys that, uh, you know, even have a winning record in MMA. And But when you look at Gabe Green, I mean, I watched his fights. A majority of his fights are at 155 pounds. I don't think he's ever won a fight at 170. I think he's 0-2 there. So this is uh, going to be his third fight at 170. I don't really know why, why he's staying at the weight class. I feel like he could make 155 fairly easily but he looks like he's pretty big jacked up but I mean I I don't really think Gabe Green is a great striker I mean he throws a lot of volume kind of tries to overwhelm guys come forward you know throw straight punches and kicks but I do feel like Roe is the technically better striker better boxer and more athletic probably but like you guys are saying it seems like especially early on Roe starts real slow and uh you know that's where Gabe Green might have a chance but even on the ground I think both both guys are pretty green as well. I do think that Gabe Green should try to shoot in on the legs and hit takedowns because it looked like Phil Rowe had like really bad takedown defense, uh, like freestyle wrestling. But in the clinch, it does look like Phil Rowe's pretty good. He has good head positioning and, you know, he can hit takedowns. But I've seen him pull guard too in the clinch, which I don't like seeing that and then just like wasting a whole round on his back. So, I mean, it's a tough fight to call really because I feel like Gabe Green too is another guy that, he has that 10th planet jujitsu too, where he likes to be on his back, scramble, and he's a flexible guy. And you'll hit these like nice sweeps, but he could also, you know, end up on bottom. And we, Phil Rowe showed he had real good ground and pound against uh, Leon Shabazian. So I'm just going to go with uh, Phil Rowe because he's the underdog and he has like a, you know, size advantage. He's more used to fighting at 170. But yeah, I don't really have a lot of confidence in the pick. I hear you. Yeah, it's, it's a tough one, guys, for sure. I'm going to end up going Gabe Green. I mean, you guys pretty much broke it down. You said everything there is to say. I just feel like Gabe Green's going to be the busier guy. Uh, you know, we saw Wayans today. Roe is a big dude. And like you said, Guru, I mean, Green probably shouldn't even be at this weight class. Uh, I really think he should move to lightweight. Now here he is fighting one of the biggest welterweights. But, man, you know, when I watch the tape on Roe, I feel like he's a guy that just doesn't use his reach well, you know, seems content to let guys get inside where, you know, the reach doesn't really make the difference. Now, if he can, you know, stay on the outside, work a good jab or something, yeah, I think he can keep Gabe Green at bay. But one thing about Roe is you look at his record, a lot of first round, second round, I mean, the fight with Shabazi went into the third, but it was like 15 seconds into the third round and the fight was over. Um, you know, this guy really hasn't gone the distance. When I watch a Gabe Green fight, I mean, this guy seems to have a really good gas tank, really good pace and a lot of output. I like Gabe Green. I think he's going to be able to go in there enact his game plan and just put up the better numbers. I do think he's the more impactful striker and I just see him being the busier man and probably winning this fight uh, late in the third round or winning the decision, probably a 29, 28. So I'm on Gabe green in this one and I like it probably more than I should uh, all things considered, but uh, let's keep it rolling. Third fight of the night, late edition, but a very good matchup. We got Andre Ewell going up against Chris Goody Ares at catch weight 140. Cody, who do you got? Yeah, the case, so again, this is another close fight, competitive fight. You can make a good argument for both sides. Uh, I think with Andre Ewell, this is why not everybody's created equal, right? He's five foot eight versus Chris Gutierrez, five foot nine. He's a, he's, a, he's a shorter man by one inch. He has an eight inch reach advantage. Like, how is that even possible? 75 inch reach advantage versus a 67 inch reach in Gutierrez. So both guys are basically the same height. 
But you see with Yule, and he has this advantage over a lot of guys, is that he's just got those long arms, and he likes to jab a lot. So it really just comes down to who's judging the fight. Look at the Jonathan Martinez fight as a classic example. Here's a fight where it appears that Jonathan Martinez is landing the better strikes. He's marching him down. He's doing some better work. But it's more volume coming out of Andre. So ultimately, the judges end up scoring for him. A lot of people are upset about the decision. It's just they decide to score it on, on the basis on volume. The Irwin Rivera fight last time out, it's a split decision. Like, who scored the fight for Irwin Rivera? But it's just, it's another thing with Andre. He doesn't really have that big knockout power. He's not going to go out there and finish you with a submission game. So it's a lot of these standing on the outside jabbing, almost like a Justin Ledet, so to speak. There's not a whole lot of finishing ability, but he can just carve up a guy from the outside. So you really do need your fighter to be closing the distance, coming at him, hopefully mixing in some takedowns. And I just, I don't know if I can bank on Chris Gutierrez to score any takedowns. So we've got a striking match. And Gutierrez, I think he's a cleaner striker. Obviously, everyone wants to talk about the calf kicks. They want to talk about the leg kicks. But I just don't really see the same volume out of him. You watch any of his fights in the UFC, and there's always a sense where he's just, like, just doing enough. Like, just doing a little bit more than his opponent. But he never, like, runs away with it. Outside of the Vince Morales fight, where Morales' leg like, gives up on him. What's really, interesting about him, what's really interesting about this fight is everyone keeps talking about the leg kicks. But this is orthodox versus southpaw, right? Andre was a southpaw fighter um, versus the orthodox stance of of Chris Gutierrez. So instead of, you know, it's not going to land the same. It, will it affect him more? Like, I, I don't know. Will the jab beat him to the punch? I don't know. I've kind of been favoring the volume on Andre Uhl, but this is just like, Udi, uh, like, uh, like Guru said on the last fight. It's, it's a close fight. So you kind of lean with the dog just because, you know, it could go either way. Maybe there's a little bit more value there. I kind of look like Andre Uhl. Maybe there's a little bit more value there, but again, this is a close fight could go either way. It, it, it's hard to feel super confident about it, but you've got boxing versus kickboxing. Kickboxing usually wins the day, but I don't know. Andre Ewell seems super motivated to get the job done, and I'll uh, I'll back him as an underdog in the spot. Sounds good. Guru, who you got? Yeah, I'm going with Andre Ewell as well. I feel like, like Cody said, I think the volume is going to be a, a big deal, and I do think that the reach is going to be a big thing as well because Chris Gutierrez isn't a guy that you know likes to – get on the inside and box or hit takedowns. He wants to kick, be on the outside, stay at range. So I think you will, you know, could pick him apart with that one, two with the straight left. And I think, you know, he's been getting a lot better at attacking the body, slowing people down because he slows down himself. So I think he kind of realizes that and tries to even it up a little bit. And I do feel like he's, he's the tougher guy. I think he's going to have the better gas tank as well down the stretch because Chris Gutierrez, I don't know, necessarily what he's been doing because i know that he was supposed to andre he was supposed to fight cody stamen last week so at least he had basically a full camp i uh i think chris gutierrez is coming in here on like a week's notice but chris gutierrez uh cody touched on it a little bit with the jonathan martinez fight he's been calling out andre Ewell for a while that whole camp like factory x because they you know think that it was a robbery with jonathan martinez so he's gonna come in try to get the win back and it's gonna be you know kicks versus boxing basically because Chris Gutierrez is one of the hardest kickers in the division, but like Cody was saying, it's going to be Southpaw versus Orthodox. So I think that's going to, you know, help with uh, Andre Yule defending the, the low leg kicks, the calf kicks. And I think that he's just going to be able to out volume Gutierrez down the stretch. Maybe even, uh, you know, Yule has gotten a little bit better with his grappling. He's a purple belt. I don't think necessarily he's going to hit takedowns or anything, but maybe he'll mix it up if it's super close at the end of the rounds. He did take uh, Erwin Rivera's back in their last fight, but, I'm going to go with Andre Ewell by decision. Sounds good. Locke, who you got? Yeah, uh, this is another close fight for sure, like these guys are talking about. And I do quickly want to just note about the whole Southpaw versus Orthodox thing. That's something that's been brought up to me a lot during this whole uh, fight week. But another fight that this was brought up in was the Takashi Sato and Miguel Baeza fight a couple months ago. And we've seen that it, they're not just stuck in one position. They can still switch positions and land their kicks of their own. So I don't think it's a completely like shot uh, argument that the calf kicks will have some damage here. But something that Cody said to me last night kind of is reeling me back a little bit on Gutierrez. Who I'm still picking to win this fight, but it does end up coming down to the output and the volume, right? Like Ewell does uh, go out there and, you know, land in the hundreds of strikes. And whereas Gutierrez is just so dead set on like damaging that calf and hoping it opens up the rest of his game. Like what if it doesn't do enough damage as he's hoping and, you know, you get into the later of the third round and you're still so behind in all these strikes, right? Um, but something about Ewell just like, I don't know, outside of his hand speed, his boxing, um, you know, the fact that he slows down in the third is, is a huge, like, no-no for me. I don't usually like betting on fighters that have that cardio gas tank or have those slowing down issues, which is what we saw in the Irwin Rivera fight where Rivera was having his most success in that third round. 
closing the distance, landing a couple of takedowns, landing some big shots too. And he was at a huge uh, height and, and a reach disadvantage, right? So you got to believe that Gutierrez will be prepared for that, will be ready to go for that. Not to mention the fact that Gutierrez is kind of taking this fight on short notice. That is a little bit of a detriment, but you got to believe uh, his head coach and Mark Montoya and those Factory X guys are definitely ready for a guy like Andre. You will hear. Um, I will still side with uh, Gutierrez. I do think his calf kicks will have a little bit more damage than most people are thinking about, but it's not something that I'm willing to like just go out there and shell out and say, okay, I'm 100% confident Gutierrez and pulling away and winning this fight. It is a close fight. For sure. It's going to be output versus damage. And in my opinion, I feel like the damage is going to be a little bit more here. It's going to immobilize Andre Ewell later in this fight. That should allow that hands to open up a little bit more for Gutierrez. And I wouldn't even be surprised if we see Gutierrez try to switch this up, you know, to clinch on to, to Ewell, maybe drag this fight to the ground, maybe win a little bit of rounds. But he's mainly a kickboxer, right? You got to take fights on a fight-to-fight -fight basis. It's a stylistic. It, stylistically, it's a different matchup no matter who you're going up against. And, uh, you know, having to make up for that reach, reach disadvantage, you got to believe that there's going to be some clinching and some grappling here from the Gutierrez side. Um, and then obviously, you know, the game plan being centered around his calf kick. So I'll go with Gutierrez. I'll go with him to win via decision. Uh, but yeah, again, not the most confident pick on this uh, on this matchup either. Yeah, close fight, close fight, close fight, right? Um, you know, I, I think this fight comes down to, you know, if Andre Ewell can, can get the hands going versus, you know, Gutierrez being probably the more well-rounded striker, you know, and, and when I say that, I say to myself, you know, I think it probably comes down to the effectiveness of those leg kicks, and that's up for debate, right? Um, I think Gutierrez has what it takes to win this fight, but I think Andre Ewell has what it takes to, to win this fight. You know, uh, we have so many red flags on both sides, you know, um, this is a fight that was put together short notice catch weight. I mean, this fight screams past to me in so many ways. I could see this being the split decision of the night where whoever loses, whoever people had their money on, they get to go on social media. They get to scream robbery when it's going to end up playing out tremendously close from a betting standpoint, man, this has got to just be a total pass for me. Like there's just so many, you know, indicators that this is a, a real sketchy spot. Um, I'm going to take Gutierrez. I took Gutierrez earlier in the week. I'm going to stick with that, but man, I just have no confidence in this spot at all. So I'll take Gutierrez, but lowest level pick for me, honestly, probably when it comes to the entirety of the card. So we're rolling on Pollyanna Viana versus Mallory Martin. And I think we're back to my man guru on this one. <laughs> Man, this is another one of these fights again to me where it's like, I don't know. I mean, I feel like Pollyanna Viana is way more dangerous. I mean, I guess everyone can agree with that. I think she has finished all 11 of her fights, uh, 10 of them in the first round. And I don't think she's won a fight that's gone out of the first round since like 2014 or 2013 or something like that. So, I mean, she's basically been first round finisher bus, which is super weird for women's MMA. But Mallory Martin, to me, I mean – she has to get the takedown here because her striking is is like real bad, in my opinion. I mean, she's real plotty. She doesn't really throw much with the hands. I mean, it's basically just a distraction to hit the takedown. I think Viana, I mean, she has okay striking. She has good uh, good body kicks, definitely has faster hands, a lot, a big reach advantage and a speed advantage. So I could easily see Viana coming in here, like touching her up, hurting her in that first round. I mean, we saw Hannah Cyphers almost knock out Mallory Martin, but – We've seen Mallory Martin take down girls and control them. And we've seen Pollyanna Viana, you know, on her back and, uh, you know, lose fights against girls that aren't really good grapplers like JJ Aldridge, Hannah Cyphers. So, I mean, Mallory Martin is a brown belt. I don't know if uh, Pollyanna is going to hit her guard submission unless she gets that early finish with the striking. I, I think Mallory Martin might be able to just, you know, have control time against the cage on the ground a little bit and win a decision. So I'm going to go with Mallory Martin, but. I mean, I could see Viana easily winning. Absolutely. Lock of the night. Who you taking? Another women's MMA fight. Another under that I'm looking at. We got plus 190 on the under that I've already hit earlier this week. And I got to predicate it strictly on the Pollyanna Viana side, who's just so wild and reckless in her exchanges. And it, just by default, I kind of gave Mallory Martin the advantage in the striking realm due to how wild and reckless Pollyanna Viana is, right? I, I, I do agree with Guru, though. She's a little bit slow in plotting uh, in her approach when she is striking. And her game is obviously the wrestling game, right? Like her significant other is Duran Wen. You better believe that she's drilling her takedowns and her double legs and her single legs. And that was my main question heading into this fight. Like, is she going to want to keep it on the feet? Is she just going to want to push her up against the gauge or is she gonna you know die or start going for her takedowns just as she normally does in most of her fights and i try to like to 
to categorize it in the same realm of like the the Bartos Fabinski versus Andre Munez fights, where we got a great uh, grappler against a solid uh, jujitsu player, or even the Ben Askren and Damian Maya fight. Right? You have a, a wrestler who needs their advantage to 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 implement their advantage. They got to go into the advantage of their opponent as well, right? And again, you can say what you want about Poliana Vienna's jujitsu and all that, but she does, you know, she's a little bit offensive off of her back, but she does she almost has that Jillian Robertson thing where she's like, you know, attacking these offensive uh, jiu-jitsu moves for off of her back and even on the when she's on top too right in terms of takedowns she really only has like her hip toss she isn't really the greatest i don't think she'll land like a double leg or anything here on mallory martin so it's going to be on martin in my opinion to get this fight to the ground if it's if that's where it's going to be and even if this fight's on the feet man it's going to be wild it's going to be a little bit chaotic again due to poliana vienna style that's why i kind of like the under here be my 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 approach is the vienna sub I think she will be able to get something uh, off here, whether it's a reversal and then just follow up with the sub from on top or even a sub off of her back. Um, but I like the much better price tag on the under two and a half, considering that we're getting plus 190. And this also covers a potential Mallory Martin finishes. I do believe if she does get past the guard of Poliana Vienna, she should be able to pass the, the other positions pretty easily as well. And she could maybe get a ground and pound finish here, maybe a submission of her own. Like Guru said, she's a brown belt herself. Um, you know, getting tapped by Verna Jandy Roba is nothing to get too sad about. Like, the girl's a high-level uh, jiu-jitsu player and probably one of the best jiu-jitsu girls in that division outside of Mackenzie Dern, right? Uh, I do favor Vienna, though. I, I think she will get the better of the grappling exchanges once this fight does hit the ground. Uh, and I am going to take her to win by submission. But my play for this one is definitely under the under 2.5 at that plus 190, 190 range. And the last fact I'll throw about this, 68% of their fights have finished under 2.5. The odds indicate 34%. So I'm thinking that we got a little bit of a, a an edge on the value and the odds here, which is why I'm liking the under two and a half. But I will go with Pauliana Vienna to win this five years. So. Good stuff, Locke. Cody Saftik, who are you taking? Yeah, I went with Mallory Martin. I think that the wrestling is going to be the key here. Again, she's her, she's a BJJ brown belt. She trains at Elevation Fight Team. She spent a lot of time, you know, I don't know. Apparently, she was working on her striking at Tiger Muay Thai up until the pandemic, although you definitely don't really see much improvements in her striking game. But, I mean, screw the striking. Do exactly what Deron Wynn did. Don't, who cares about the striking? You want to get a win? Go out there. Use that wrestling. Get this girl down. <clears throat> Paula and Vienna. She's got a really suspect takedown defense. She gives up takedowns rather easily. And even herself, when she's offensive wrestling, when she's trying to get the fight to the ground to try to use her BJJ, it's all like, you know, judo trips or like head and arm tosses or like really low level moves that generally end up with your opponent and end up ending up on top of you. Now, yeah, Guru nailed it. She's got a lot of first round finishes, but you'll know in a lot of her fights, she kind of tires after the first round. Like she doesn't get that finish. The J.J. Aldrich fight, she comes to mind. Where it's like she's really tired, and then now she's getting on top of JJ and can't do anything to her. JJ's able to just scramble up, get back to the feet, and then make her pay again. Her striking's non existent, but I mean, I guess it's non existent on both sides. Mallory Martin, bad striking. Paul and Vienna, bad striking. Paul of Vienna, uh, um, sorry, uh, Pollyanna Vienna is apparently the high level BJJ black belt, but again, this is a girl that got submitted by Veronica Macedo inside of a minute and a half. So it's very hard to gauge, like, how good is the BJJ? Is it that good that she's going to sub Mallory Martin for sure if Martin gets the takedown? I'm not so sure about that. Martin's kind of been around. I mean, she was something like an eight-fight amateur. So she fought eight times as an amateur. That's pretty, a lot of experience in this day and age for an amateur fighter in MMA. And then turning to pro, the only time she's ever been finished is Verna Jandanova. And, I mean, hey, that there's no shame in that. And, again, in that fight, she was able to go two rounds. So Vienna is not able to get that first-round submission. I see the takedowns, the top control, the ground and pound, and just the positional awareness, hopefully going Mallory Martin's way, enough for her to uh, to get a decision victory out of this, but uh, or a late submission for that matter. But yeah, you know, again, this is just it. You'll see a trend on this card. I'm so unbelievably confident. Everybody's so unbelievably confident in the main event. It's like the most confident pick of the year consensus wise and yet the rest of the card is just an absolute <laughs> shit show and this fits the mold of absolute shit show but i think i i honestly am a wrestling kind of guy i think that wrestling top control being able to just dictate where the fight takes place that'll be key keep in mind here mallory martin might be a better striker or she may not be but the wrestling is going to allow her to dictate if she wants to strike or not if she is a better striker use that wrestling to keep the fight standing and beat her strike. If you're not a better striker, use that wrestling, take her down immediately and, and use it. But at least it should give her the option to, to, to choose where the fight plays out. And then as far as arm bars from guard, like you're a brown belt, man. Do not get arm barred from guard for the <laughs> love of Christ. Don't, please. 
Um, although we've we've seen it happen many of times, especially with Pauline Vienna, right? Like she's like either getting armbarred from guard or slapping on one herself. So I expect the unexpected is what I'm getting at. Uh, but I'm gonna go with Mallory Martin by decision. Definitely. Yeah, I tell you what, you guys, I think I got the look on this one. Uh, so I ended up picking Mallory Martin, and I'm going to stick with that. But you look at Pollyanna Viana's last 10 fights, okay? And that extends even beyond the UFC. That goes all the way back into jungle fight. But you look at her last 10 fights. She's first round or bust. She either wins in the first round or she goes on to lose the fight. It's just that simple, and it's that black and white. Uh, I, it's a, a live betting, live betting opportunity. If it's after the first round, Pollyanna Viana has not busted off that submission, that arm bar from guard. You can, the, the numbers back you fully. She's going to go on to lose. Now, don't get me wrong. Women's MMA, things could happen. It might not happen. Maybe, maybe you look at it for, as a different data set. You go, well, she's due to get a win outside the first round. I don't know. All I know is the numbers usually don't lie. I think Mallory Martin could be a good live betting opportunity coming out of that first round. Uh, if she hasn't just, you know, held her down and beat on her, but. Tricky fight. Viana absolutely live to hit that arm bar. Uh, I got Mallory Martin in this one. But from a betting standpoint, I think it's probably the live situation. But then again, the number might not be great. I'm just putting it out there. But the pick is Mallory Martin for me. Cruising along. Here we go. Diego Lima versus Bilal Muhammad. And it's my man lock up on this one. Yeah, I'm kind of I, I absolutely agree with the Bilal being the favorite here, but five to one is a little bit of a stretch. I think we can all agree on that. Like Bilal Muhammad is an above average fighter that just is great all around. Right? I mean, he's not like a BJJ specialist, not a wrestling specialist or anything like that, but he just does such a good job of mixing everything together and, uh, you know, putting a full MMA display on just as we saw in his last fight against Lyman Good. Right. That's a fight where he was going up against a very tough Muay Thai striker and Lyman Good coming out of that Shulman camp. And uh, he did a good job of nullifying the amount of strikes that were coming his way. And then just mixing it up, mixing a couple of takedowns, uh, his movement as well, too. Uh, and then obviously his boxing game, which is pretty, uh, pretty solid as well. With here with with Diego Lima, obviously he's coming off a long layoff. Last time we saw him was UFC 243. The same night Israel Adesanya uh, unified the titles against Robert Whitaker. So that obviously does put a little bit of, uh, you know, um, threat into the the Diego Lima side in terms of pulling off a victory here but I'm not completely sold on the fact that you know Bilal deserves to be a minus 500 favorite here like Diego Lima he's one of those guys in the past that I've looked to fade you know I mean Jesse Taylor cashed against him uh Yushin Okami cashed against him then the Court McGee one that's the one where I've uh, you know was eating shit there because Diego Lima comes out with a much better game plan you know has shows off solid striking in that fight and then the Luke Jamal fight like I'm not I see it as a split decision but it seems like a quite obvious play that, or at least a obvious call that he should have won that fight on all three judges' scorecards. Like that was a clear win for him. Yeah, went out there, outstruck uh, Luke Jamal, took him down a couple of times, accrued over two and a half minutes of control time in that fight. But that's another fight where we saw his evolution in his striking game as well, too, as he's another guy that's starting to take on that calf kicking game as well, too. Given his size, given his reach and all that type of stuff, I think he could absolutely implement that to the best of his abilities. And I think technically speaking, he's probably the better striker here than Bilal Muhammad. Now, does he mix the MMA game together as well as Bilal Muhammad? That is probably where Bilal has the advantage, right? He'll probably be able to mix in his striking with his takedowns and all this movement and, you know, all this live action and fighting a guy like Bilal after a year and a half layoff is probably not the best thing for a guy like Diego. But I still think that if like if we see 100 percent Diego Lima here, he can make this a much tougher fight than the odds are indicating. So I, I, I am still going to pick Bilal Muhammad. I still think that he wins, but I think that Diego Lima is definitely much more dangerous than a lot of people are expecting here. And I personally think that. The over two and a half is a much safer spot than actually parlaying a Bilal Muhammad, which, which is probably what a lot of people are doing at this point in time. But I do see this fight going to a decision. I don't think either guy is going to get a finish. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if Diego Lima at the end of this is the one with his hand raised. So uh, I will side with Bilal, though. I do think that he has, uh, again, the advantages of mixing the game up much better. I think he'll land some takedowns here. I think he'll be able to nullify the black belt in jiu-jitsu from Diego Lima. But I think, uh, again, it's, it's just that overall MMA. MMA game. Personally, I would land this closer to maybe like a minus 250 for Bilal, minus 220 or something like that, minus 233 if you want to get specific. Um, but yeah, I I'm taking Bilal and I'm going to take him to win this five year decision. Sounds good. Cody Saftik, who you got in this one? Yeah, re watching it, it seems like it's going to have a lot of similarities to Diego Lima versus Court McGee in that, you know, Bilal Muhammad is a generalist, right? He can strike, he can wrestle, he's got great cardio, he's got a great chin. It's just going to be on him to, to, to 
put the pressure on him. Corbin McGee wasn't able to do it. He got 0 for 8 on takedown attempts. And then ultimately, you see where Diego Lima is a clean, a precise striker. But the numbers are pretty close. I think Bilal will be able to be successfully get a few of those takedowns. And that should be the difference maker. But a 5 to 1, you know, minus 470, I mean, it is an astronomically high price tag. So I think the way you kind of play this one, try to play it a lot safer, is that fight goes the distance at minus 195. When you look at Bilal Muhammad, seven of his last eight fights, have gone the distance. If you plan on knocking this man out, you had better be the Vincente Luquez of the world because, I mean, he's gone the distance with Jeff Neal. The Alan Joban fight, he was on skates for basically seven and a half minutes and still survived. He does got a really... The guy's fought during Ramadan a bunch of times where he's, like, dehydrating himself, not eating. Like, Bilal Muhammad is extremely durable. So if Diego Lima is going to spring the upset on him, I don't know that he catches him and knocks him out the way he caught... Chad Laprise and natural 55 or like I, I I don't think that materializes I think like Locke say he probably is a slightly crisper striker his takedown defense has gotten a lot better he is a BJJ black belt the guy's you know older brother Douglas Lima is uh is is a bona fide gangster and this guy's in the room with him every day at ATT Atlanta there's no doubt that Diego Lima, the year and a half off, he's not still totally old. He could come out here and he could surprise us. But if he comes out there and fights an excellent fight, it'll be like that Court McGee fight in which he stuffs those takedowns, lands the better strikes, wins that decision. If Bilal's going to win, Bilal's going to win exactly how he always wins. Unless the Takashi Sato fight. Okay, one time. That's why I said seven of his last eight fights went to decision. Because you're right, right. He submitted Takashi Sato in the third round. Well, did I mention Diego Lima technically does have a BJJ black belt? Um, if anything, he's just going to hopefully survive. Now, Jesse Taylor is the largest welterweight you will ever see in your goddamn life. He was also on the GAC. <laughs> and uh, and the guys, if he takes your back, he's got a rear naked choke. Like he submitted a number of high level BJJ black belts. Uh, he's just got one of those like grips. Like if he gets on your back, puts you in a choke, you're done for. So I'm gonna give him a pass on that one. Outside of that, his, his you can see that his grappling has improved. I'm just hoping it's improved to the level that he should be able to be fine if he does get taken down by Bilal. And uh, listen, Bilal's not all of a sudden a submission wizard. He's got one late third round submission win over Takashi Sato. Okay, let's leave that on the table. So minus 195, fight goes the distance. That does cover you on both sides. It's way better than betting Bilal Muhammad straight up. And with Diego Lima's, like as much as I would like to take that underdog shot, I do think that Bilal Muhammad is just one of these guys that's relentless. Like he'll, he's, he's easily down to go 15 minutes. He could easily go down 25 minutes. Back when he was the Titan FC champ, 25 minutes, no problem for this guy. He likes to fight these decision type fights. So he, he can just keep grinding away at you. And that's where you see the Tim Means fight. He's getting busted up. He's getting beat up. But it's that it's that being in great shape, that attrition, just being able to keep grinding yourself. He starts to wear on Tim. Tim slows down. If Diego has his way early against Bilal, I think Bilal will work his way back into it. But minus 470, I should not even be considering you getting beat early, right? Like minus 470 should be a walk in the park. Let's be real. And this is not exactly screaming walk in the park. Last thing I want to mention is that when you got a guy that always fights decisions, and Bobby Green not no longer on the card, but he's a good example, right? He's always fighting decisions. And so a lot of them, more, more times than not, are going to be close decisions. Well, you don't love betting a guy at minus 260 in these close decision spots. Blah Muhammad, he's always going to decision. A lot of these decisions are pretty close and competitive. So for minus 470, you probably don't want a ton of exposure on that. But you're going to try to improve it. If you've got Bilal, you're really firm on him. You can turn that 470 to a minus 150 by taking Bilal by decision. If you want to cover yourself on both sides because you're not fully sold on Bilal or you don't fully want to fade Diego Lima, just take the fight goes the distance. Sounds good. Guru, who are you taking? Yeah, I mean, they broke it down pretty good. I totally agree. I mean, when you look at Bilal 5-1, to one, I, I just – I can't really see that because he, he does fight to his level of competition. I mean, even his last fight with Lyman Good, I mean, that was, I think it was like, a, it was a real close fight. I know some people definitely thought, you know, Lyman Good could have won. He dropped it and uh, hurt Bilal pretty bad. But the thing about it is, I mean, I do feel like Bilal is just going to be able to use his all around game. Like these guys have been saying, just kind of outwork Diego Lima. But I do think he, uh, you know, if Diego Lima can keep it on the feet, it could be really close because Colby, or he isn't really like super technical. I feel like he has kind of like a Colby Covington, like poor Colby Covington style, where he's really just trying to overwhelm you with volume on the feet, hit takedown, stuff like that. And he, he's probably going to get the win, win another decision, but I think it'll be competitive. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's worth it to lay that minus 500. So, you know, the minus 195 fight not to go to decision or fight to go to decision, like they said, I think is uh, pretty good. 
Uh, it sounds like a good prop to me, man. Like, it, 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 cause it does, it totally bums me out. I'm on Bilal Muhammad, right? I don't see Bilal Muhammad, an incredibly well-rounded guy losing to a dude going to split decisions with recent court McGee and Luke Jumo. You know what I mean? Like, um, but they are, they're both, I feel like they're both guys that kind of fight to, to the to the level of their opposition, right? But Bilal just always seems to have that little bit, that little bit extra, that little bit more. Um, and I, you know, and I do, I think he gets it done here. Uh, I like that prop quite a bit. You guys are, uh, you guys got me thinking about that one because Bilal at minus 500. Yeah. I mean, props to if you got him earlier in the week, but I mean, what was he earlier in the week? Minus 400, you know, it's still just <laughs> a, total, a totally wide line. You know what I mean? But, uh. You know, I I think Bilal's the side you want to be on. If you're a value better, I mean, you you could you could convince me that there's value on a, uh, you know, on Lima. But man, he's just not his brother, and he's just a super inconsistent dude and a guy that at one point I felt like had a pretty bright future. But man, I don't know. Like I feel like you know he seems like a very like cheerful, happy guy, and I just don't know if he's got that killer instinct in him. You know, his brother's got that killer instinct. His brother goes in there wanting to hurt somebody. I don't know, man. I just feel like Diego's just not that guy. And uh, I feel like his career's just kind of been a letdown for me thus far. So I got to take Bilal Muhammad in this spot. And I think you guys are on to a pretty solid prop there, man, because Bilal is a decision machine. All right, last prelim. Pretty cool matchup. Hadolfo Vieta going up against Anthony Hernandez. And I think you're up on this one, Cody. Yeah, I, this is a this is an intriguing fight. It's a fun fight, and we're all here to watch Hadolfo Vieira. We all want to see how good Hadolfo Vieira is, how far he can take it. I, I'm sure by this point, everybody knows his BJJ credentials. He's a former ADCC champ. He's you know one of the most recognized guys in the world, really. It's certainly, at one point, the, he's the black belt hunter. If he gets you to the ground, you are in a world of shit. The thing is, is that he's not necessarily a refined MMA fighter at this point. I'm not sold on his cardio, A. I mean, he's so big and thick and just chiseled up that you know that it takes a lot of energy out of you. He muscles all of his takedown attempts because they're like jiu-jitsu style takedowns where he's just trying to peel his opponent to the ground, put two hooks in, you know, secure a position on him, and all of a sudden start working for that submission. But I'm not super sold on his cardio. As far as the striking defense, I mean, we've seen Sapper, what Sapper Beck Safarov could do Frunky up the middle, swells this guy's eyes shut. It kind of looked like he was a little bit dazed in there as well. I, I just, if I'm not sold on your cardio, I'm not sold on your your chin, I'm not sold on your wrestling, it's like, man, it just what what bails him out? That jiu-jitsu. The guy could theoretically pull guard and have a lot of success, but I don't like guard pullers. I like guys that are going to go out there and earn the takedown. If they got to go to a plan B, they have a plan B. And that's one thing about him is that he, I don't necessarily know that he has a plan B. Now, when you look at Gilbert Burns, Gilbert Burns is an excellent example of how a BJJ guy can make that successful transition to MMA. Gilbert Burns comes in, and again, he's a really high-regarded BJJ expert. But he basically, it, it takes a backseat. It, it takes a backseat window, and uh, he just starts working on his striking hard with Henry Hoof and the guys of the Black Zillions and Hard Knocks 365 and now Stanford MMA. And you see that the progression in Gilbert Burns' striking game and how far it's come and how his cardio has improved a lot and how his wrestling's improved a little bit and how, you know, he's added all these other wrinkles to his games. And as me and Locke talked about last night, now he's not submitting guys in the UFC, right? Like he has, he's submitted one guy in the last five years as, as far as MMA goes, but it's like, he's knocking fools out. Like he's added all these other wrinkles to his game. He's a complete fighter. He's now challenging for a world title with Adolfo Vieira. Like, I'm not sold that he made any improvements to his game whatsoever other than his jiu-jitsu. When you look at his at Fusion XL in Orlando, Florida, who's he training with? Jacques Ray Souza, who's a now in his 40s, certainly not the man he used to be. And coming off a nasty knockout loss, he trains with Philip Bro, who hasn't fought in a year and a half and making his UFC debut. He uh, works with Alex Nicholson. One time got arrested in Winter Springs, Florida for attacking a woman in a 7-Eleven. Um, like, you know what I mean? Like, that's not exactly that little strip mall in Orlando is not exactly you Mike Perry, like his, his life is in complete disarray. So where is he working on his striking? Who's he working on his wrestling with? But his jiu-jitsu is just really good, right? So he goes in there and he probably takes down Anthony Hernandez. And if he does, he's going to submit Anthony Hernandez. And honestly, yeah, I, I agree. I think at some point he, the fight's going to hit the ground. He's a very strong physical guy. He will be able to drag down Hernandez. And once he does, it's just like Marcus Perez. Marcus Perez took down Anthony Hernandez, finds the neck, just, uh, subs him with an anaconda choke second round. Once Vieira hits the ground with you, like you're you're in a world of shit. And I think that will be the likely outcome. But similar to where we're talking about Blal Muhammad in this last uh, that this last breakdown, it's like, do you trust him for that price tag? And with Vieira, you know, I seen him struggling and huffing huffing for air. You know, late in the second round against Oscar Pachoda, 
I seen his eye completely swell shut. And the doctor basically tell him, like, I'll let you finish this round and then that's it. Against Saperbeck Safarov, Mr. One ACL. Well, now he's he when he moves up the ranks, when he moves up the division, he's gonna get caught by somebody. And Anthony Hernandez has not looked good in the UFC to this point, but He's certainly a, a step up in competition. He's certainly got some skills. But yeah, at the end of the day, he himself is a grappler. Like most of his wins are by guillotine choke. He won something like five straight fights by guillotine choke. He likes to clinch up his opponents and submit them. His only resemblance of success in the UFC was scoring six takedowns, Jung Young Park, and getting that submission. The Brandon Allen fight used that grappling. Yeah, grappling is off the table in this fight, bud. You had better keep this fight standing and box this guy up for 15 minutes or or force a stoppage and that, that I can't trust Anthony Hernandez. So I don't want to take the, the, the shot on the underdog, but I'm recognizing that like Vieira is not, he's not a future middleweight prospect. I, I, he's only 31, but he, I don't think he set himself up in a situation to improve all those skills that he's going to require to be a top five or 10 guy. Absolutely. Guru, who are you taking? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think the line is uh, probably a little wide, but I'm, I got to go with Adolfo Vieira, man. I, I think that he's just going to be the better athlete, the more physical guy. When you look at Anthony Hernandez, like Cody said, I mean, he wins a majority of his fights uh, via grappling, and you've seen fights uh, like where he fought Brennan Allen, and he's getting taken down uh, within the first five seconds of the fight. I mean, he's just letting himself get taken down, and it seems like he likes to kind of scramble on the ground like give up back his back mount give up mount and then you know try to explode in reverse and stuff like that i mean against fiera i don't think he's gonna guillotine that guy i don't think he's gonna be able to get out of the back mount any of that so he's gonna have to be able to keep it on the feet and i've just i mean besides the knockout he had over jordan right i've never really seen him have a game plan where he's gonna keep it striking keep it at range he's a guy that likes to crash the distance he does have power in his hands but i don't think he's gonna you know, have the composure to make it a, keep it a striking fight. I think Vieira is going to be able to get a hold of him in the clinch, probably take his back and get the submission. So, yeah, I'm going to go with uh, Vieira here. Lock, who you got? Yeah, this is another one where, like, the line is just a little bit too wide, right? If you're giving me two spots, whether I'm taking Bilal at minus 500 over uh, Diego Lima or Vieira here 4-1 to one over uh, Anthony Hernandez, I'd have to go with Bilal, right? You're getting a slightly worse price tag, but you're getting a way more uh, consistent and trustworthy fighter. Is one of our guys in the chat here, Chris Grieve, hit the nail on the head. Like, this whole card seems to be full of a lot of inconsistent fighters, and that's what we're getting with Anthony Hernandez, right? This is a guy that was going into his last fight against Kevin Holland as a pick -em. That just shows you that people believe in this guy's skill set and that he could actually bring it to the to the table and actually like do something. But then he gets dispatched within 39 seconds and people just forget about him. And he's thinking that he's just an absolute scrub, right? There's so many instances like over the last several months now where somebody's coming off of a first round knockout, they come into the next fight as a heavy underdog, and then they spring the upset, right? Like the, the, it's absolutely possible. And when you're talking about a guy in Rodolfo Vieira who just seems very one dimensional in his approach, you know, just trying to muscle his way to, to the ground and, and it really huffing and puffing if this fight does end up in the second round. Anthony Hernandez is absolutely live to, to, to go out there and spring the upset. This is another solid live betting opportunity as well. If this is something that's in your wheelhouse, right? If Hernandez survives that first round, things are going to get very interesting. That's for sure. Um, yeah, these guys hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, Hernandez being the guy that just seeks the, the takedown, tries to overwhelm you. A guy that he reminds me of, and this is a bit of a stretch to some people, but Cain Velasquez, right? I mean, like maybe not the greatest technician with the hands, but does enough with the hands to get you thinking about them. Then before you know it, the guy's in on a double leg, he's taking you down and he's starting to, you know, work in some ground and pound. Now he probably doesn't have the, the grappling or the wrestling background that one Cain Velasquez has, but that's pretty much the game plan that we've seen from Anthony Hernandez and all of his fights dating back to his LFA days. But like like Guru said, the first thing you see in the Brendan Allen fight is Allen getting this guy to the ground, and it's hard to not say that Vieira will be successful in doing the exact same thing. Like, just look at the guy. Like, John Allen Anik is always salivating at the mouth when he sees this guy in the cage because he has, like, one of the best physiques in the game, and you got to believe that translate, translates into some solid strength, and I think he'll be able to get the takedown here against Anthony Hernandez super early. So 
my, another spot for me here. I, if you want to parlay chalk in this fight, parlay the fight doesn't go to decision, right? Even though under one and a half is a little bit dicey, considering if we see Hernandez survive that first round, maybe it gets pushed a little bit longer. But I don't think that Vieira will have enough gas to go the full 15 minutes. And given the game plan and style of Hernandez from the past, the guy is an all action, moving forward at all times kind of guy. So I don't think he's going to let Vieira start to breathe and 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 get any type of space in that second round. And that's where Hernandez should really start to put it on him. So maybe this is a a, a prime uh, round three prop opportunity for Hernandez if you think he has any shot of winning this fight. Even round two, depending on how much uh, Rodolfo Vieira is truly huffing and puffing if this fight does end, uh, you know, get into that second round. But again, that takedown defense is just so sketchy on Hernandez's side that I do think that we'll see Vieira get this fight to the ground. And I do think we'll see him pull off the submission. And last thing I want to say, that Marcus Perez fight, very, very skeptical. I feel bad for the guy. You know what I mean, gets hit with the body shot early in that second round and is just reeling from it from the entire time. And not only is he reeling from that body shot, he's having to defend all these submission attempts from Marcus Perez, who ends up locking up that anaconda choke and choking him out that way. But... Yeah, the, the guy's just had a tough run over the past couple of fights. I feel bad for him because like he was a highly touted prospect coming into the UFC, especially after uh, starching Jordan Wright the way that he did. And obviously his past performance over Brendan Allen, where they went a full five rounds, probably one of the best fights in LFA history easily. Those guys were just going to absolute war. But uh, yeah, this one in the jiu-jitsu realm seems a little bit too much for uh, Anthony Hernandez. So I'll take him to win, but it w or sorry, I'll take a Vieira to win, but I would not be surprised at all if we see uh, this fight get pushed late and Hernandez ending up getting the TKO late. So possible round three prop for Hernandez, but I do think this ends in the first round with Vieira getting that tap. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, hey, listen, Adolfo Vieira is a guy that we've we've seen the clues. Like, we know this guy probably not going to be a top 10 type dude. He's definitely going to hit that spot, man, where he's going to come up against somebody who's not going to get subbed in that first round or early in that second round. And somebody's going to drag him into that deep water. And that's the game plan here. You know, if Fluffy's going to win this fight, it's survive, survive, survive. Take this fight as deep as you can. Once he starts a huff and a puff and you start teeing off on this guy, right? Uh, however, I don't think it's going to happen. I'm taking the big old favorite here, Adolfo Vieira. Uh, I just think that, yeah, he's going to go out there. I mean, look at this guy. Jacked City. I mean, him and Kamaru. Damn, I don't know who was blowing it up on that scale more today. Uh, somehow Kamaru's got that cardio edge, though. A little bit suspicious about that. But uh, we'll get to that here shortly. But uh, I got Adolfo Vieira, man. I think he's going to get him down. Uh, even if he doesn't necessarily get him down, who's to say he just doesn't get on this dude's back? He's so freaking strong. Such such good jujitsu. I don't uh, I don't see Fluffy lasting. Man, even if he can last the survive the first round, I see this fight ending probably before the midway point of the second. I got Hadolfo Vieira on this one uh, by sub. How else could you take him, right? All <laughs> right, kicking off the main card, we got Ricky Simone going up against Brian Kelleher. Who's up on this one? Is it Guru? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And yeah, this is one of the better fights on the card, I would say. I mean, it was going to be on the prelims. They moved it up to the to the main card. I don't think it was supposed to be on the main card, but Ricky Simone and uh, Brian Keller, they, they were supposed to fight, uh, I think, two different times. And it's kind of funny because like the first time Ricky Simone pulled out and Brian Keller went in there and got the submission win. The second time, you know, Brian Keller pulled out, Ricky Simone went in and got the submission win. So they set it up. I think Ricky Simone's fighting on like two or three weeks notice. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's basically finish or bust for uh, Brian Kelleher, but he does have a, you know, a good chance of a finish because on the feed, I mean, I do think he has the power advantage. I think people give Ricky like a lot of shit for striking. I mean, he's super hittable guy. And I mean, he was <laughs> making Ray Borg look really good in the striking, like when they fought each other, but I do think that he has the faster hands and throws a lot more volume than Kelleher. I, I think that his uh, leg kicks are going to maybe play dividends as well. So I think that on the feet, as long as Ricky Simone doesn't get hit with that, you know, big bomb by Kelleher, he'll probably be able to outpace him. I don't necessarily think that the uh, forward pressure or anything like that from Kelleher is going to tire out a guy like Ricky Simone. Simone probably has some of the best cardio in that division. So I don't think it's going to be like a, one of those cases, like a Hunter Azure where he can get him tired and then, you know, finish him in the second or third rounds. But, you know, we've obviously uh, seen Brian Keller is real dangerous with that guillotine as well. So Ricky Simone has to be real careful, you know, if he wants to go for takedowns. But I honestly think he, he could win this fight just keeping it on the feet, outstriking him. I do think that, you know, Keller is obviously live for a finish. I mean, we've seen Ricky Simone uh, clipped and submitted. We've seen him uh, 
finished by guys like Uriah Faber. So his chin is a little suspect, and he has been dropped and submitted before. So Calher could do that, but I, I can get aside with Ricky Simone. I, I just feel like he's going to be able to have more output. He's going to you know push it down the stretch. I think it's going to be similar to the Cody Stamen fight, maybe not as dominant because I don't think that – He's quite as good a boxer as Stamen is, but I just think Ricky Simone is going to be able to do enough and uh, not get finished. Absolutely. Locke, who are you taking? Yeah, uh, Gru talked about how these guys were matched up a couple times in the past, right? And I find it interesting, the last time they were matched up, Ricky Simone was minus 185, and we had uh, Kelleher at plus 160, plus 165. And the only thing that's changed is Ricky Simone went out there and beat up a, a guy that just got signed to the UFC on short notice and who was more than likely going to get smoked out by uh, Ricky Simone, and that's exactly what happened. We saw Ricky Simone accrue over seven minutes of control time in a nine-minute fight and then eventually finish this guy later. But uh, I don't think that should have any any indication of how this fight with Brian Kelleher is going to go. They're completely different fighters. Kelleher is obviously, you know, has years of experience at this point in time, has been fighting the toughest dudes in the division as well. Uh, whereas this Gaetano Perella guy just comes onto the scene and, you know, people think that Ricky Simone dusting this guy is going to have an effect in how he's going to do against Kelleher. I just don't see it. So if you want to talk about line value and perspective here, maybe Kelleher does have a little bit of value considering uh, you were getting him at plus 165 in the past. But I still do see this fight heavily in favor of uh, Ricky Simone in terms of being able to mix it up as best as possible. And it's funny because we've seen Kelleher in his last couple of fights fight uh, guys that are, you know, the template or the or the the prototype is the same. Like you got Hunter Azure, wrestler. Uh, you got uh, Cody Stamen, wrestler. But out of all of those guys, I think Cody Stamen is the one with the best uh, striking uh, from a, a guy with a wrestling base. And then Ricky Simone has got to be a close second. But I think that he still does a good enough job of going out there and mixing up his game. I think he'll be able to land a couple of takedowns on Kelleher here, but I think that Kelleher does a good enough job in terms of getting back to his feet. He has decent takedown defenses himself as well, too. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Ricky Simone kind of having to work a lot harder to get the takedowns if that's the approach that he wants to take here. Uh, but I, I do think that the cardio of Simone will hold up. I think the output of Simone will, will hold up for him as well. Um, and also the Uriah Faber knockout. I think that's a bit of an anomaly, right? Like that's one of those freak moments where it's just like, okay, when do we ever see Uriah Faber knock anybody out? And in that amount of time, we've seen uh, uh, Ricky Simone take some shots from other guys and he still keeps on ticking and still keeps on moving. I like to compare it to like Jimmy Rivera when he got knocked out by Marlon Moraes, right? Like Moraes, yeah, great. He does have knockout power, but we, we've seen Jimmy Rivera never finished since then right he got knocked down twice by Piotr Jan but can you really blame him it's freaking Piotr Jan 135 pound champion whereas Ricky Simone here we see him with the durability still we see him still chugging moving forward even after getting hit now Kelleher obviously has some power on his shots and obviously we know he has that guillotine as well but I do think that we see uh as Simone pretty much nullify that entire game of Kelleher put on a complete performance here and uh go on to win a decision so I think the the way you want to approach this is if you don't like that minus 250 ish on uh on Simone, seek that decision prop. That's probably the best line that you're gonna get on Simone here. But I do think he goes out there and uh handedly wins this fight, probably 30 27 all around. Absolutely. Cody Saftik, who are you taking? Yeah, I'm excited for this fight. It should be very exciting. Obviously, they tried to book it a few times and they kept trying to book it at 135 pounds. So it's interesting that this one was, I guess, bumped up. Um, regardless, here's the thing with Ricky Simone. This guy wants you to the ground. Chances are he's going to get you to the ground at some point. And, and that style should play out really well against Brian Kelleher. And that I, I'm going to agree with Guru on this one over Locke's assessment. I don't think that Ricky Simone has a very good chin. I mean, everyone always wants to talk about the Faber knockout. But besides that, Anderson Dos Santos had him absolutely rocked bad in their Titan FC fight before submitting him. And then you look at every other fight that Ricky Simone's been in. He's getting chopped up by pretty much everybody. Ronnie Yaya boxed this guy up. Ray Borg boxed this guy up. Ray Borg is a 63-inch reach, by the way. It bo absolutely box him up. But what's that one thing in his back pocket? That wrestling. He can go out there and he can score takedowns over anybody. Now, people don't really list Ricky Simone when they're talking about top wrestlers in the division. But here's something interesting for you. So the last fight against Gaetano Perello, whatever, that's a throwaway. Seven takedowns. But, you know, it's, it's a Belgium striker. No big deal. Ray Borg, right? He took down Ray Borg seven times. Ray Borg's only ever been taken down one time more than that, eight times against Demetrius Johnson in a five-rounder. Outside of that, the most he's ever given up in a fight was four. So getting taken out seven times by Ricky Simone, that's that's impressive, right? Simone against Rob Font, that's three fights ago now. Six takedown attempts. No, no one has ever completed more than two against Rob Font in the UFC. Ricky Simone was six, right? The four takedowns against Ronnie Yaya. Who would want to take down Ronnie Yaya, right? 
but yet he goes out there, he, he completes four takedowns on him, right? Marab Dubashvili has had seven fights in the UFC, okay? Ricky Simone is the only man to ever take down Marab Dubashvili inside the UFC. He did so twice. So that's the kind of the difference is that even though his striking is lackluster, his chin might be a little bit lackluster, his cardio is great, his wrestling is solid. His top control is not great, so he allows his opponents to get up a lot of the time. But you get back up, and he just rinse repeats on you. I think his, for his last camp, he switched over to Timo Yama in California. I really do think that you're starting to see some improvements in his hands, but that wrestling is his bread and butter. And when you look at Kelleher, Kelleher cracks pretty good. He's got that guillotine choke, but I don't see him submitting. I, I don't mean, it's certainly possible, but Ricky Simone doesn't really got much of a neck, you know what I'm saying? So pulling guard on a guillotine choke, like that's a, it, it, it's one of those flash-in-the-pan moves. I'm not going to bet money on a guy based on one submission of many submissions. It's like, what else do you got for me? But Kelleher is like a go out on your shield type guy. And I think he's going to bring that pressure early. He's going to try to do something early. And if Ricky Simone just neutralizes him, grinds him, does what Cody Stamen was able to do, minus the good boxing, just score more takedowns, grind on this guy. Eventually, Kelleher gets tired. Eventually, Kelleher probably wilts a little bit. And hopefully, at that point, Ricky Simone takes over. Now, again, Ricky Simone, for all the good things he does have, he's another one of these decision guys. Most of his wins, they're decisions. He, his best punch is not enough to knock you out. His best submission doesn't seem to land it in the UFC. It's a lot of these decision type victories. So with Kelleher, even though he's a kill or be killed type guy, he loves hitting those unders. It does scream more of that Cody Stamen fight where it's like you're able to largely neutralize him. And uh, yeah, I, I think I'm going to go with Ricky Simone and I'm going to try to improve a not so great price tag by chasing another decision prop. Sounds good. I'm on Ricky Simone too. You know, I just feel like he's probably the better fighter, man. There's, there's, I'm high on Ricky Simone. I like this kid a lot. Uh, do have to worry about the chin issues. And I tell you what, man, going up against a guy with the nickname Boom, who we've seen lay down the boom, I mean, it's a little bit risky. I mean, Kelleher's kind of live at all times, man. Uh, he catches you on the chin. He can put you out. We've seen this guy have some serious stopping power. You know, another thing that I think about, too, is, you know, Ricky Simone, if he's going to go out there, he's going to do Ricky Simone shit. He's going to be hitting those takedowns. Brian Kelleher's got a phenomenal guillotine, you know, probably – I'm not going to rate it the best in the UFC. I mean, we got Brian Ortega. We got Du Bronx. But, man, it's up there, you know. And when he snaps that thing off, he can snap it quick. And dudes tap fast. But, um, like you said, Cody, Ricky Simone, not much of a neck there. Really good wrestler. I think he's going to be able to handle it. Outside of getting caught in a guillotine or just eating a bomb and getting knocked clean out, I got to go Ricky Simone. So, Ricky Simone's the play for me. Another big old heavy favorite. What can we do? Uh, maybe you chase the, the distance prop. I don't think it's too bad. Um, but Ricky Simone's definitely the play for me. All right, here we go. Julian Marquez going up against a Maki Patolo big time layoff for Julian Marquez. Is it my man lock up on this one? Yeah, you're right about that uh, layoff for Marquez. We haven't seen him since Israel Adesanya for Brad Tavares. We're talking about close to a three-year uh, stint since we've seen Julian Marquez actually get into the cage. His last fight, obviously, that split decision loss to Alessio Di Carico. Very close fight. Could have obviously gone either way. But I think we saw a little bit better movement, a little bit of versatility, and the striking range from uh, Di Carico, which probably gave him the win there. Julian Marquez seems like that, like, slow not slow but like plodding heavy, uh, guy that just wants to move forward and uh, let, throw some bombs throw some big strikes uh apparently he's been working on his grappling and his submission game which probably would fare very well for him in this fight against uh, Mackie Patolo but I still gotta side with Mackie here right since so his first fight in the UFC is down at 170 against Callum Potter the guy looks absolutely atrocious on the scales and obviously it affects his performance where he goes out there and just completely gasses out and loses as a minus 400 favorite right that 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 one left a huge bad taste in a lot of people's mouths where they're just like okay this guy just can't cut it anymore now he's at 185 pounds where he, he did eventually pull off a victory over charles bird then he goes out there and loses to um impa kasanga and i and i'd also believe that um uh, and then he lost to Darren Stewart as well via choke. But I think that we saw a little bit better account of himself in the Impact Sangana fight where he still, even in a loss, he still went out there and landed uh, 71 strikes. The guy is a great technician when it comes to the combinations. He throws some good strikes, throws some, throws some good punches and kicks. Uh, and I think that might be a little bit too, uh, too much for Julian Marquez here, especially if we see that Marquez that we've seen from the past, which is just move forward, try to throw bombs, try to throw some combinations. But I just think that Patola is the much better fighter in those, uh, in those exchanges. Now, people might just want to write off Impa Kasanganai because he got highlight Rio KO'd by Joaquin Buckley, but that guy's 
quite a good technician when you're talking about from the striking range, maintaining his distance, throwing and landing combinations of his own. And I definitely gave a guy like Mackie Patolo some issues. But Julian Marquez here doesn't strike me as a guy that, you know, throws with that type of uh, confidence in his combinations or anything like that. And then again, mixing the factor that we're talking about close to three years since the last time we see him in the cage. I'm not sure how you can really have that much confidence in him, especially him at that minus 165, minus 175 line. Now, if he comes out there, like I said, at the top of this breakdown and tries to just grapple him, that's probably his best best pass to victory. But have we really seen him take that approach inside the cage? Mm-hmm. I haven't really. We need to see it first before we can truly bank on him going out there and doing such things. No. The thing that he's most famous for outside of his podcast with Kendra Lust is obviously his head kick knockout of um, uh, Phil Haas on the Contender Series. That first round, he's getting a little bit mollywopped in that fight, right? Phil Haas, strong wrestler, takes him down time and time again. But that cardio does not hold up of Phil Haas, and that leads to that beautiful highlight reel mm-hmm. knockout that we always remember now from that uh, that head kick of Julian Marquez there. But Ultimately, I think it's going to be a stand-up fight. I think that we see Mackey Patolo put his com- combinations together a little bit better, move around a little bit better, uh, and it's just going to be a little bit of a, a rude awakening almost for Julian Marquez from being away from the cage for so long. Uh, I think it's really going to catch up to him. Uh, he might need this fight just to get his feet wet, and he could find some success later in uh, in upcoming fights. But this one stylistically seems to be a little bit tougher for him, especially if it stays in the striking realm. So I'll go with the dog here. I'll go with Patolo, and I think he wins this fight via decision. Also, last thing I want to say, a lot of people are saying that these guys are just going to be trading and throwing bombs until one guy goes out. I'm not really in that realm of uh, 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 play here, as I do think that both guys are quite durable. I think we we haven't seen Julian Marquez taken out. I think he has a decent chin. I think that we'll see Mackie Patolo. Uh, you know, accumulate that volume and that output, and that's going to be enough for him to get that decision victory. Right on. Cody, who are you taking? Yeah, I think this prob- fight also probably does go the distance. It's just it's hard to get a beat on Julian Marquez. He looked like he'd be an okay prospect. He's obviously got the win over Phil Hawes in contender series, comes to the UFC. The fight with Darren Stewart was sloppy, but he gets himself a submission win. And then you see the wheels fall off against DiCirico. And with DiCirico, it turns out, yeah, he's a pretty decent fighter in his own right. He's most certainly capable of uh, holding down job in the UFC over multiple fights. He's, he's a decent enough fighter. But then Marquez, yeah, two and a half year, years off. He hurt his back. He's had multiple major surgeries. He, you know, uh, had a doctor tell him he'd never fight again. I and mean, he left Las Vegas. Now he's training in Kansas City. He's had all these unknowns that the one thing that keeps getting back to me is that he didn't have great cardio to begin with, right? He knocks out Phil Hawes in the first round, head kick. It's a quick finish. It's just like, oh, cool. You know, not sure how that would have worked. The Darren Stewart fight, he is gassed, man. They're both gassed, let's be fair. But he is really, really tired, and then he snatches up the guillotine, and then you see him in the Alicio DiCirico fight. It's the same thing. He's really tired. So now you take a guy who had cardio issues to begin with as a 27-year-old. Now he's now he's now now he hasn't fought in three years. Now he had two major surgeries on his back, and – why, what level has he been able to train at over the last number of years? Like, does his cardio suddenly get that much better? Like, I, I don't know. Realistically, he probably goes out here, and if he does want to get in a slugfest with Patolo, he's going to get tired after a round and a half, and then it's anybody's fight at that stage if he doesn't get the finish. But I, I'm going to train a thought that I'm going to flip the script on this, right? Julian Marquez has not completed a single takedown in the UFC. In fact, he's, he's given up multiple takedowns pretty much every time out. Um, but he hasn't been a wrestler to this point. But you see a lot of these interviews of him over the last number of years where he talks about, I can't spar, but I've been working on my grappling. I've been working on my grappling. I'm working on my grappling. He lists a pile of training partners. You know, it's something that he's been really working on. So now he's at uh, Glory MMA and Fitness with James Krause. Now, anybody who knows James Krause knows that, like, he's a master tactician, right? He's able to take guys like Zach Cummings, you know, guys with mid-level skills, and formulate winning game plans. This is what you need to do in order to go and get the win. He himself is the same way. You know, he's an undersized welterweight that has gone out there and picked up some solid victories on the basis of good game plan. And so if the game plan for Julian Marquez after a three-year-long layoff is go throw hands with a guy named Coconut Bombs who has really nice tactical boxing and loves to rip the body, it's not a good game plan. A much better path of victory would be go out there, use your natural size, get a hold of this guy, peel him to the ground. Callan Potter... Even though it was at 170 and it looked like um, Patolo had a bad weight cut, Callum Potter looked way bigger than him, proceeds to go take him down three times. The Charles Bird fight, he takes him down early. He's having his way until he tires out. When you look at his frame, five foot ten at middleweight, it's not a big middleweight frame, but he can't make welterweight. And, you know, he's got that natural boxing gift, so you give him a pass on it. Mark has all six foot two of them. You see the back on the guy? He's a very thick, strong, physical guy. 
he goes out there and gets a takedown on Patolo, or at the very least wears on Patolo and presses him up against the cage and just tries to drain out some of the energy, then the boxing is less effective. You slow down the pace, you score a couple takedowns, you get that victory. Once you get your feet wet in the UFC, you get a couple rounds under your belt, then you can go back to the Marquez of old, having these barn burner fight of the nights. But for this first fight back, you need to go secure the victory, and surely Kraus is telling him the best path of victory would be to go and get those takedowns. Now, the last thing I want to mention is the uh, Mackie Patolo versus uh, Impa Kasanganai fight, right? That's a fight where Mackie Patolo looks really good in the first round. In fact, he outstrikes Impa Kasanganai and wins the first round. And for whatever reason, the second and third round, his output just falls right off. Like, he got tired in what was just a boxing match. What was It was just a striking match. This is the fight that Mackie Patolo wants. He still got tired. Go lean on this guy and tire him out and make it a dirty fight. Use that size advantage. It would be a path to victory for Marquez. I would normally say, I would just like to pass on this. Can't trust Marquez long layoff. He's the favorite. I, I don't, I'm not fully in love with Patolo, especially at 185 pounds, but the Julian Marquez by decision was plus 270. So I was like, okay, you know what? You, uh, you, you, you piqued my interest a little bit. I mean, I'll have a little bit of a feeler on that and hope that James Krause is saying, thinking the same thing I am, and that's just grind this guy down. Don't try to chase one of these fight of the nights. Don't try to get in one of these slugfests. Just go use your natural size. Use this grappling you've been working on the last couple of years. Put it to good use. For sure. Guru, who are you taking? Yeah, I agree with Cody. I think that's what Julian Marquez needs to do, especially early on. He has to try to you know, get in the clinch and – lean on on Maki, wear on him because he did look way bigger at the weigh-ins. I mean, I bet you he's probably going to be, you know, 10, 15 pounds heavier than Maki easily in the cage tomorrow. And he has, a, you know, a pretty big height and reach advantage as well. And I just feel like uh, in the clinch, Marquez is going to be a lot more physical. He's pretty good. I do agree, though, like uh, if they just strike at, at range, I think the body shots of Maki are going to be really definitive because I could see Marcus starting to get real sloppy and real tired and kind of get desperate if they kind of keep it at range. But the thing about Patolo is, I mean, you see him all the time get drawn into these firefights too. I mean, it's not like he stays technical in that many fights. I mean, you're watching his fight with uh, Darren Stewart and he's piecing the guy up. He's staying technical. He's moving. And then all of a sudden he just decides to start brawling with them, gets clipped, goes for a takedown and, you know, gets front choked, which we saw, uh, you know, Marquez due to Darren Stewart. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, at some point Maki started brawling with him and Marquez maybe clipped him because I do think uh, Marquez is the more durable guy. I mean, we've seen uh, other like kind of lower level fighters knock out Maki, like Cassius Kane, people like that. So I definitely think Marquez could knock him out if he touches his chin. And, you know, I, I just, it, it's a lot of red flags for Marquez. So I could never bet on it or anything like that. But I, I'm, I'm kind of confident that Marquez is going to get it done. I do think too, like Patolo, he took a lot of damage in, you know, his last few fights, his fight with Darren Stewart, the fight with uh, Impa Kasangane. So maybe, you know, his chin will be a little bit weak here. Maybe Marquez will look better than we think, but you know, a lot of variables there. So I'm going to just totally pass on the fight, but the pick's going to be Marquez. Oh, man, Guru, you took the words right out of my mouth. Like, if if this was the Marquez from three years ago, the last time we saw him, yeah, I would take Marquez in this spot, you know. Uh, Patolo, I feel like, you know, just a pretty pretty limited path to victory here, albeit, you know, who, who who's to say he can't knock out anybody if he connects, right? But, man, Patolo's kind of let me down, you know. Initially, when he moved up to middleweight, I thought he looked pretty good, but it's just it's too much, it's the size discrepancy, man, and we see it in this fight, you know, um, immediately, you know. Um, but at the same time, how, how am I going to back a guy like Julian Marquez, huge injury, massive injury, potentially career ending injury on top of so much time off. I mean, I question whether or not there's even more going on there. I mean, a catastrophic injury, but my God, what kind of injury takes three years to come back from maybe the injury he had legit, you know, I, I really don't know. But at the same time, man, uh, I do feel like Marquez is going to win this fight. You know, I, I've, Almost feel confident Marquez should win this fight, but at the same time, man, to bet on a guy on that big of a layoff, huge injury, way too many red flags. There's better spots than this, man. I'd feel like a total bum. I'd feel like a total jobber if I were to put some money on Marquez and he goes out there and looks like a shell of himself, a ghost, an imposter, an impersonator. Just going to have to be a total pass for me, man. If anything, I think you could probably argue that a, a Patolo bet could make sense. Patolo, listen, this guy's probably getting his walking papers if he loses this fight. He might really just go out there and go for it. Might really jump on a guy who's going to be dealing with ring rust, a guy who just hasn't been in the cage lately. And Patolo's been very active. So total sketchy fight. The pick's Marquez, but I, I can't have nothing on this one. 
All right, we are up to man. I can't. I got to get your guys' input on this one because this is a this is a fight that I just can't even really make up my mind. Still, we got Kelvin Gastelum going up against Ian Heinish. Is it my man Cody on this one? I think. Yeah, absolutely. So again, this comes down to game planning and what kind of fight does Kelvin Gastelum want to have? I mean, when you see in the Israel Adesanya fight, it's a war. It's a fight that's probably 2-2 going into the fifth round. He's got Israel Adesanya, the GOAT at 185 pounds right now, rocked with a head kick. I mean, he's got momentum in his side going into the fifth and unfortunately loses his soul in that fifth round, dropped multiple times, 10-8 round against him. And then since then, it's like, it's the tale of two Kelvins. Like, what does he want to do? He's super hesitant in the Darren Till fight, and then he ends up dropping a decision. And, and I thought in the, the Hermanson fight, I mean, he was a little bit reckless, ends up falling right into to Jack's hand, gives up the leg lock. What 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 version do we get here? If he fights up to his capabilities, I think he's definitely capable of beating Ian Heinish. It's just, it, it depends what the game plan is. One thing about Ian Heinish is that his takedown defense does not hold up. If you look at, say, he was on Contender Series, right? He got taken down by Justin Sumter. His UFC debut against Cesar Ferrer, he gave up five takedowns. Antonio Carlos Jr. He gave up four takedowns. Brunson, he got taken down twice. Omar Akhmedov, he got taken down twice. The Jared Mirchard fight, only time in his UFC career and Contender Series career where he did not get taken down, and that's because he knocks out Jared Mirchard in a minute and 14 seconds. And then you have not seen him since then. So we're coming off on almost a year-long absence for Ian Heinish. Again, he's giving up a lot of takedowns. He was improving his 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 uh his striking a lot over at Tiger Muay Thai. You see him in the in the Mearshart fights like, oh wow, Heinish has been working on his striking. But ever since the pandemic, and he hasn't been able to get back to Thailand. He's fighting out of Genesis uh for this camp. I mean, ultimately, this is how I think the fight plays out. Kelvin Gastelum is a slightly better striker. I mean, I wouldn't say slightly, he is a better striker, right? You've seen him go in there with guys like Darren Till, who is, you know, a former title challenger, but you've seen him competitive against Israel Adesanya. You see him competitive against high-level guys, even though he's beaten up all the aged legends like the Vitor Belfort, the Ronald Jacare Souzas, the Michael Bisbinks. They're all former champions or former title challengers or guys of a very high level. Ian Heinish has been fighting all of these top 25 guys, most of whom are no longer with the company. That's kind of the level he's been operating at. So I think Gel Kelvin Gaslam could win the striking match. But again, it's all about making this an MMA contest. Strike with him long enough to mix in a takedown or two here and there, just to secure these rounds. Heinz is durable. Heinz is the natural middleweight, so he'll be a little bit bigger, but he hasn't got the stopping power to knock out Gastelum. And, and barring Gastelum doing one of these classic performances where he just doesn't really throw anything, and it's a really slow-paced fight, and it could go either way, barring that happening, he's got the skills. He's got the quicker hand speed. He's got the bigger power. He's got the better wrestling. His cardio checks out. I mean, he's been in a, tons of five-round fights, scheduled five-round fights. If he apparently he's super motivated, three fight losing streak, backs against the wall, doesn't want to get cut. Clearly, if they're releasing guys like Anthony Pettis, clearly a guy like Kelvin Gaslam is probably not overly safe. And he made a really ass big ass of himself when Whitaker pulls out and the guy's walking around with a fake belt, <laughs> being like, "I'm the champ." It's like, what? What are you doing, man? Is it, and they say it's bad luck to touch the belt. You're not the champ, right? And this guy really did parade himself around like he was the next coming of Christ. And all of a sudden, now he's on three-fight losing streak and hasn't been looking good. And, you know, it's just kind of been a bit of a downward spiral. But he's still young. I think he's motivated to get back in the win column. And they've given him a very winnable fight here in Ian Heinrich. So it's no disrespect to Heinrich. Is that Kelvin is the, the better operator. He has the back class. He's competed at the higher level. And, and I think that this is a good fight for him to get back in the win column. Even though it might not be one of these runaway-type performances, it might be a relatively close decision, it'll be one of these ways for him to get back in the win column. For sure. Guru, who you got? Yeah, I, I mean, me personally, this is another fight where I think the line is is too wide. I mean, we have Kelvin coming off three losses in a row, so he's definitely the one that doesn't have the momentum. I think Heinish, he has either two wins in a row or he only has one, but it's the you know the big knockout win over Gerald Mearshart. And, uh, you know, in terms of the fight, though, I do think that Kelvin, he's the better wrestler and he's the better striker, so it's just going to come down to if he drops the ball. You know, I mean, if he allows Heinish to pressure him and throw more volume and just doesn't let his hands go like CJ said and lets uh you know lets him just win on points but I feel like Kelvin should be able to outstrike Heinish he should be able to out wrestle Heinish I think Heinish to me I mean he's not really super technical he wins a lot of these fights just because he you know super tough he's athletic he's definitely like you know super strong durable guy so he comes forward he wears on these guys and he's been fighting a lot of grapplers where 
he's really good at anti grappling. Like he'll defend takedowns, you know, shoot submissions off his back. He can get back up to his feet, scramble. And he's been able to tire these guys out and then just kind of beat them down the stretch. And with Kelvin, I mean, it's possible that Kelvin comes in here. I didn't really think that Kelvin looked in that good of shape at the weigh-ins. I mean, to me, he didn't look – so I don't I'm know if he's, gonna, if he's that motivated or not. So, I mean, I'm not really that confident that Kelvin's going to come in here and look super great. But I Ian Heinish is a durable guy, so I don't know if Kelvin's just going to knock him out. I think it's more likely going to be a decision. And I'm going to side with Kelvin just because I think – He's the better striker and he's the better wrestler. So he should be able to win the striking hit takedowns, deny the takedowns of Heinish. But I mean, if this fight comes down to like a split decision or Heinish outworks him for three rounds, I mean, I'm not going to be that surprised. So I'm going to go with Kelvin. I mean, I think that he's the better fighter. He needs to have a bad performance to lose, but I mean, we've seen him do it before. So I'm going to go with Kelvin, but not extremely confident. Locke, who you got? Yeah, I, 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 uh, echo the same thing as Guru in terms of the, the weigh-in thing, right? Uh, immediately, as soon as I saw him, I had to go back and watch his Jack Hermanson weigh-in as well. And he looked the same shape. You know what I mean? Like he, It seems like at this point in time, when he's so set on being at 185, he's just not doing what needs to be done to truly be comfortable at that weight, right? Like, will he fill out his body to truly be at this weight class whereas you're seeing guys like Adesanya who's moving up to 205 and you see him taking the measures that are required to actually be comfortable at 205 pounds same thing with John Jones going up to heavyweight you see him doing all this weightlifting and and trying to get strong and really fill out that body whereas Kelvin it just seems like the complete opposite where he's just like ah I just you know I don't have to worry about my diet as much anymore or something like that right that that just seems to be his approach but the funny thing that I, when looking through Kelvin Gastelum's record like let's just look at his 170 run like since moving up to 175 uh, 70 pounds uh or sorry 185 pounds i should say uh johnny hendrix he beat tim kennedy he beat vitor belfort he beat michael bisbing and jock ray souza damn five guys that he's beaten and you're just like are you kidding me like these guys are clearly all past their prime johnny hendrix post usada we know what johnny hendrix post usada is like right complete uh opposite of what we got pre usada so uh, when you just look at those wins alone you're just like okay he's going out there and beating on old timers and does ian heinish really fall into that category no but in terms of talent wise he doesn't really stack up against the guys that um calvin gaslam has been losing to israel adesanya darren till jack romanson you know, Chris Weidman in 2017 still had a little bit to offer. You know, I mean, he started a great wrestling game, had a good submission game, obviously tapping him out later in that fight. Didn't have the greatest, uh, you know, looks in the first a couple rounds, but then obviously Calvin Gaston starts to fade and the the power and, and the the size and, and the wrestling, Chris Weidman really starts to catch up to him. Does Heinish have that really to, to lean on? I do think that Heinish will be the stronger guy here, but when it gets into those grappling and those scrambling exchanges, I still think that Calvin will have a step, will be a step ahead. I think you'll will be able to you know uh you know land a takedown or end up on top if they're scrambling on in one of these weird situations when it comes down to the boxing and the striking you got to give the edge to calvin gaslam again right to a better technical striker on that uh that side of things ian heinish i'm sure he wished that he got more time over there in thailand at tiger muay thai really trying to refine his game there because we saw some great things from him in that gerald mirashard fight but again that's just one fight and that's Gerald Mirchardt, who is probably one of the slower guys in the division and, again, continues to feed that Hamza Shmaev train because he got dead by him in like 15 or 20 seconds, right? So now we get to see Calvin Gaston against a guy that, yeah, is obviously bigger than him, will probably have the strength advantage. But when we're talking about skill set now, it's probably, you know, closer to the middle of the pack. And the middle of the pack guys are the ones that I think that Calvin can still beat at 185 pounds, where his skill will overcome the, the size discrepancy that he's going up against. And this might be another, you know, just a, a decision victory for Gaslam. Minus 225, though, you know, considering he's coming off a three-fight skid right now, it's a little bit iffy. Right? I mean, you, you got to figure out where this guy's confidence level is, where he's truly at mentally, and if he's even been at the gym, right? Like, uh, how often is he going out there to King's MMA and training with these guys and trying to get in those rounds and really try to refine his game rather than just being like, I can go out there and beat a guy like Ian Heinish even on my off day, right? You got to question his mentality and if he's actually going to be in it. You know, being the third front from the top on a, on a pay-per-view, hopefully he's motivated to go out there and be like, guys, I'm not done. Like, I still got something to something left and i can show you guys that i can replicate the first couple rounds that i had against israel adesanya but we just haven't seen it as of late so at minus 225 it's it's a pass on my end i still think he ends up winning if we're getting closer like minus 150 for gaslam i'd be a little bit more on board with trying to play him there i think that's a much better line uh but again heinish 
he's just been getting away on like grit and like uh, being able to outscramble some of his past opponents like ACJ and Cesar Fajera. But I don't think he's going to be able to get away with that against a guy like Calvin Gaston, who still shows small bright spots. And even though he's just been beating up on old dudes, that, you know, recently, uh, he should be able to go out there and beat a guy like Heidish. So I'll go with Gaston and I think he wins this fight via decision. I'm on Gastelum as well. You know, uh, wow. It's just, it's been insane for Kelvin Gastelum, which I got to tell you what, man, I am very appreciative of this losing run he's been on because I have bet against him every step of the way and just being cash in phenomenal underdog spots. So thank you, Kelvin Gastelum. But I'm going to back Kelvin Gastelum in this spot. I mean, this is a guy that took Israel Adesanya, arguably the champion of the division up from where he should be because I'm one of those guys that thinks Gastelum gets the diet together, gets the motivation and make 170, dude, but he's obviously not going to do it. He can't do it. He missed weight so many times, got kicked out of the division, and he's older now. He's never going back. It's not going to happen. I'm going to shut up. I'm going to stop talking about it. But 185, I mean, this guy took it all the way up to gold, like Cody said, walking around with a fake belt, making himself look like a total prick. Uh, what are you going to do, right? Uh, but, man, it's just been a terrible run, you know? But I do feel like this is a step down in competition. Uh, I, I think Ian Heinish could win this fight, though. I, you know, I've, with with Kelvin Gaslam, I know he's the more skilled guy here. He should win this fight, but I feel like something is wrong. I don't know if Adesanya mentally broke this guy and taking it to that the highest of heights, that that championship opportunity, and then to lose that fight. I don't know if it's a motivation thing, a mental thing. I just don't know what it is. But he's just not the same guy. But man, his back is against the wall. He's got to win this fight, or the dude's probably next in line for Bellator. I got Kelvin in this one. I don't see him losing four in a row. I don't see him losing to a guy like Ian Heinish. But, man, um, I did ponder earlier this week, man. Ian Heinish at better than plus 200 or sitting around that area. Not bad. But uh, Kelvin, man, he's got to get this one done. I, th I think he does. I think he, wins a, I think he wins a decision. All right. We're up to the co-main. We got Macy Barber coming back from that big injury layoff as well against Alexa Grosso. Uh, Guru, are you up on this one? Yeah, yeah. This is a this is an interesting fight for me. I mean, I don't necessarily think it's co-main event uh, on a main <laughs> on a pay per view like, but uh, I mean, I think it's a good fight. I mean, Macy Macy's returning. I guess they still uh, have hope for her if they're going to put her, you know, at this spot. But I'm I'm going to go with Macy in this one. I I, I just feel like uh, Alexa Grasso. If you look at her career, I mean, she's really struggled uh, versus grapplers. She's gotten taken down and. I mean, arguably, you, even if you look at the random Marcos fight, that was a split decision. So she could have lost every single fight that she's fought against a grappler in the UFC. And uh, I, I just feel like, I mean, the boxing, I definitely think that Alexa is going to have the advantage. I think that she has the better movement as well. But especially at 125, I just don't know if she has the power to keep a girl like uh, Macy off of her. And, and she's not going to take her down or have that type of top game. And pressure like Roxanne has I don't think she's going to be as physical like that either in the clinch so that's kind of Macy's best area is roughing these girls up being the bully so I think that she's going to be able to uh you know eat the shots of Alexa get on the inside land uh, you know elbows knees the bigger shots kind of slow Alexa down you know I think she could hit takedowns and I think if she gets on top she could do damage and definitely control Alexa Alexa you know she's pretty good at you know creating a you know, scrambles with their submissions, but she has no submission wins. So it's not like she's a big threat there. I don't think that she's going to be able to hold Macy Barber down if she swept her or anything like that. So I definitely feel like uh, Barber is going to come in here in shape. I don't think that, you know, she's one of these girls that's going to lose confidence after a loss. I think she's going to be hungrier. So I think she's going to be ready to go. I think she'll be ready to push a pace if Alexa makes it a tough fight. And I just think she's going to land the bigger shots and be able to uh, mix in the grappling and uh, get the win. So I'm going to go with Macy in this one. Sounds good to me, Guru. Locke, who you got? Yeah, this is a, a fun fight. Maybe not co-main event status, but definitely a fun fight. I'd, I'd like to compare it to the, the CDF and Benny Dariush fight that we had last week as we have people on both sides that are very strong in their opinions on uh, who they believe is going to win. So you know, on the contrary side to Guru, I'm actually on the Alexa Grasso side. I like what we see from her from the technical striking standpoint. Obviously, the better hands here. And we've seen Macy Barber struggle against girls that have that technical advantage. But then she's always able to rely on that power. She's always able to rely on, like, surviving that. Well, not surviving, but, like, getting through that first round where she drops it. Like, she dropped it to J.J. Aldrich. Obviously, dropped it to Roxanne Matafari. Obviously, there's so many, like, uh, other X-Factors that went into that Matafari fight. So I don't want to lean too far into that one. But uh, when she is 
dealing with somebody who has confidence in her hands, I think she falls into some trouble. Now, like I see the the grappling and clinch exchanges, uh, and that's the main argument here for Barber. She should have to go in there and, and kind of bully uh, Alexa Grasso, just like Felice Herrick did in the past, just like Tatiana Suarez did in the past. But again, I'm I, just whenever people have like losses to Khabib Nurmagomedov, I just automatically nullify the Tatiana Suarez ones too because that girl is just a champion waiting to 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 be crowned. And then her only other loss, Carla Esparza, another high level woman who is very successful and going out there and grapple fucking her opponents. That's exactly what she did to Grasso. But Grasso did a good job of getting back to her feet. Again, like Guru was saying, threading off her back with a couple of submission attempts. Didn't complete any obviously, but did enough to get back to her feet and then really get her striking going. Um but then again we obviously know what Carla Esparza's striking game is like, right? Um I like what we see from Grasso, though. I think that her hands are obviously going to be much more polished here. Uh, also, mixing the fact that we got uh, Macy Barber coming off that knee injury. She's been, uh, you know, have been away from the game for a full year now. Last time we saw her was UFC 246 um, back in January of last year. Uh, if she if she's not successful in closing the distance and getting her hands around Alexa Grasso, I think she's going to have some trouble in truly tracking her down and, and getting a win here. Is she going to be able to knock out Grasso? I, I don't think so. Like, we've only seen Grasso win or sorry we've only seen barber win decision uh win by decision once in her career more often than not she's just getting built up by her striking and her punches obviously very heavy on her kicking game as well too but i think we'll see Gr grasso stand her ground and uh you know counter those strike uh counter those kicks with strikes of her own and really start to put it on uh barber as well it it's just so demoralizing for me to see as a as a barber backer her getting kind of like put on her butt by JJ Aldrich a couple of times in that first round. And now you're putting her up against the best technical boxer that she's fought in the UFC and in her career period. And uh, that's Alexa Grasso. And I think we're seeing some solid improvements from her on a fight to fight basis. People can say what they want about her, you know, having three losses in the UFC now, but you know, outside of the fleece hair one, which was still relatively young in her career, losing to Tatiana Suarez and Carla Esparza is not the worst thing in the world. Like she's the one getting put through the ringer. She's the one fighting these highly experienced women. Whereas, Macy Barber has been pretty much just, you know, finishing the Jamie Colleen's and, and, you know, Jay Aldrich is a middle of the pack kind of girl. And, and then the Roxanne Modafari fight, you know, tears her ACL, but, but still doesn't really make a good account of herself in that first round. Um, I, I favor Grasso here. I think she's going to be able to keep the distance. I think she'll get her strikes going and I'm going to favor her to win this fight via decision, I, possibly a finish, but I, you know, Grasso's not much really a finisher, especially if this fight does stay in the striking realm. So I will uh, stay on the Alexa Grasso side. I think she uh, pieces up Barber, keeps her on the outside, keeps her at bay. And uh, not to mention, you know, I mean that, that knee, she's going to need that knee at hundred percent to keep her movement, to allow her to get inside, get those takedowns. If she's able to be successful, with them and if not it's going to be a very very tough night for her if this fight does stay in the striking realm so once again i'll go with uh alex grosso to actually win this fight via decision cody saftik who you got yeah there's an old saying you can lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink right and basically the saying in t mma 2021 is you can lead a fighter to the octagon but you can't get them to complete a takedown and this is a fight where it's the same thing man it's like barber should shoot the takedown. When you saw her in her entire regional show career, right? She used to be a four Collins MMA with Ryan the Lion Schultz. The whole game plan is you're very strong. She's only five foot five. Her and Alexa Grasso are the same size. Let's get it, let's get it real. But they're not, right? Height and reach is one thing, but physical like strength and thickness. And Macy Barber is the more stronger, powerful athlete. And when she's coming up the sport, she's taking down opponents and blasting them. And then Something gets in her head. She's going to be the next world champion, and she's going to be the youngest world champion. And her dad, Bucky Barber. Yeah, I know, I know. It's the name of a porn star, but it's 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 her head coach and her father. And he just like leads her down these like just episodes of delusion, where it's just like she truthfully believes that she's the 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 next. She's going to be Valentina Shevchenko, and she's this and that. And somewhere along the line, she falls in love with her power. And we've seen that from a lot of wrestlers, a lot of grapplers, is they knock out somebody, and all of a sudden, it's like, wow, that was thrilling. I want to do that more often. But you look at the entire run. It's not just the Roxanne Monteferi fight. The Hannah Cyphers fight, she got outstruck in the first round. She actually got outstruck 35 to 34 by Hannah Cyphers in the first. But then in the second round, she does get that takedown and smashes Cyphers. The J.J. Aldridge fight, she's getting pieced up. She's losing that fight. She's easily getting outstruck. And then the power comes in and it bails her out. The Jillian Robertson fight, she knocks out Jillian Robertson. But now she's got this sense of, I'm a striker. Goes out against Roxanne Monteferi. Tries to be that striker and against Roxanne Mata Ferry of all people and gets beat up. So, like, is her technical boxing good? No. 
it's that strength and that aggression. And you got to use that to press Grosso against the cage and try to take her down and make this an ugly fight. She was doing it earlier in her career. That is what she is capable of. But you got to get back to what got you to the dance. And that's that that grind. When you look at Alexa Grosso, her entire career, she's really largely struggled against that grind. Yeah, we give her a pass against Tatiana Suarez because, you know, she's got that grind that very few people have. But you see it in the Felice Herrig fight where Felice Herrig just bullies her down, out muscles her. You see it in the Ronda Marcos fight where she gets taken down four times but ekes out a split decision. You see it in the Carlos Sparza fight where she just gets backed up and gives up some takedowns. That, that strength and that grind and that ability to take her down, that's what's always cost her. And all of those fights were at 115 pounds. At 125, yeah, she's got the win over Su Young Kim, but outside of that, she's going to be in trouble against these stronger fighters. And Barbara's still young. Barbara's still green. We're definitely not sold on Barbara still being a future you know, champion, but who's to say that year off wasn't good for her? Take the time off. Get back to the basics. She's been working with Izzy, Izzy Martinez, the former uh, John Jones's former wrestling coach, and it seems like she's committed to you know achieving what her potential was beforehand getting back to her basics and that basics is wrestling so i'm really hoping she does that grosso is very difficult to put away so if you are going to beat alexa grosso i think it's going to be by decision and barber by decision was plus 300 so it seemed like a pretty big price tag considering it it's it's a close fight it's a dogger pass type fight for me i got it earlier in the week it was macy barber plus money now it's kind of short up closer to even but still, plus 300 for that Barbara by decision. If, if there was any avid, and, and the flip side of that with Alexa Grosso, if she's going to win this fight, one would think again it's going to be by decision, right? I mean, Barbara was able to survive on one leg for 15 minutes. Grosso is a natural fit, one 15er. Plus, she's not really heavy on the power punching herself. So I, I see this fight going the distance. I'm just thinking Barbara's going to be able to use that size, that strength, a little bit of grappling, a little bit of wrestling. And, you know, I've brought my horse to this water, this body of water now. I'm just really hoping it drinks. Barber, you're here. You got here. Please use some wrestling. That is the key to victory here. I'm with you guys fully. Uh, I got Barber in this one. I think this fight's going to come down to that strength. It's going to come down to uh, Barber just, you know, go kind of just going into smash mode, you know, because Grasso is the way, way more technical fighter. I mean, if Barber gets... I'm going to go ahead and say stupid and goes out there and just kind of wants to stand and trade shots uh, allows Grosso to kind of stand toe to toe with her. I mean, Barber could, I, I think Barber will land the more powerful, the more impactful shots, but I can see this going to a decision where Grosso just doubles her up on numbers, you know, just kind of hits her with the pitter pattern, and just kind of, you know, out points her to the scorecards. But I feel like that's unlikely. I feel like Barber knows, you know, she needs to make this an ugly, dirty, brutal fight, uh, put Grosso up against the fence, work to the takedown, use some elbows, just be, be a smashing machine, you know, go in there. I, I just do what she does. I mean, that's really how she's been throughout her career. And that's what I see her being here. You know, maybe she's going to be a little more polished. Maybe she's added some fresh wrinkles to the game. Uh, Cody, you talking about the fact she's added Izzy to the mix up. I think that's good stuff, man. I think she's going to come in here. She's got to know the path to victory. When you look at Grasso's performances, where does she come up weak? It's to the takedowns. It's to the wrestlers. It's to the people with the heavy top game. Barber, I think she's going to be much stronger. I think she's going to go in there, enact her game plan, and just have the stronger will. I see Barber getting this one done, but I'm split, man. I don't know if this goes to a decision, or I don't know if Barber can put a good enough pounding on her that she can finish her. I'm just going to take Barber at the plus money. But, uh, man, by the time this fight goes off, I wouldn't be surprised if Barber's going to be the favorite. I got Barber in this one. Okay, that's your co-main. Oh, boy. We did it again. UFC 258, our main event. Kamaru Usman versus Gilbert Burns, the training partners. Damn, this is going to be a good fight. I think it's my man Locke up on this one. Yeah, obviously on a on a fight that's riddled with very very close fights, you got a chalky uh, champion coming in here, and I think he's very much deserving of it. I think he's gonna probably go down as one of the best one seventy years to ever do it. And even though he may not have the most entertaining uh, approach to his fights, you know he had that one banger or firefight against Colby Covington, but for the majority of his fights, the guy goes out there you know, lays on his opponents, lands some good shots and, and just controls the fight for the, for the majority of the 25 minutes or 15 minutes when he was fighting three round fights. But 
another guy that was similar in that back in the day was our guy GSP, right? A lot of people are like, the guy's boring. You know, he just goes out there and just wins his, and wins his fights. Doesn't really try to go for it and try to get the finish or anything like that. But a win is a win at the end of the day. You know what I mean? You're, you're walking home with that win bonus, and that's exactly what matters for, to some of these guys. You know, GSP had the whole, I uh, got Canada behind me. So he was able to sell some uh, pay-per-views and all that type of stuff. Kamara Usman, I'm not sure how many people down in Nigeria are going to be bu buying pay-per-views to watch this guy fight, but you know, he still goes out there and he wins. Now, I want to talk about Gilbert Burns a little bit in terms of, I think that people are almost overblowing how good he's been looking as of late. 4-0 at welterweight, great. Looks amazing. He's clearly making improvements as well too, right? His striking is definitely taking uh, a huge leaps and bounds in a positive direction, especially when he's lined himself up with Henry Hoof down there at Sanford MMA, Hard Knocks before it was called, and even Black Zillions before that. But uh, he came into the UFC pretty much just as a jiu-jitsu guy, and he's one of the best uh, cases that we've seen for a guy that's been making and rounding out his striking game. And it's worked out for him, right? Go out there and knock out a 42-year-old, 43-year-old Damian Maia. Oh, ho. Oh, oh, oh. now he goes out there and rocks and drops Tyron Woodley in their first round and he dominates him for the majority of that 25 minutes and pretty much gets the same scorecards that Kamaru Usman got but I, I, we know what we're getting with Tyron Woodley at this point in time right the guy just backs up backs up backs up waits to land that bomb telegraphs it so much that his opponents see it coming they're able to get out of the way and they're just able to counter with their own game like getting a victory like that over Woodley is just not that impressive to me nowadays but I do want to make one comparison in terms of when Usman fought Woodley and when uh, Gilbert Burns fought Woodley. So when Gilbert Burns fought Woodley, he landed a total of 156 strikes uh, and accrued eight minutes of control time. You know what Kamar Usman did to this guy? Landed 336 strikes Ooh. and had 18 minutes of control time in a 25-minute fight. That's the difference between these two guys. Kamaru Usman has that next level. Now, aesthetically, it looks like Gilbert Burns probably whooped his ass a little bit more because he dropped him a couple of times. But like when you look at the statistics, when you look at the DraftKings score as well, too, Kamaru Usman absolutely blows his performance out of the water, right? But Usman is just another step up compared to what Burns has been going up against. Go out there and knock out a guy in Damian Maia. What? How does that affect his fight here against Kamaru Usman? Going out there and blowing out a guy like Tyron Woodley, how does that affect his performance here against Usman, who's clearly on a different level? It, it, to me, welterweight is like Kamaru Usman, Kobe Covington, Gilbert Burns, and then the rest of the welterweight division, right? There's uh, Other than whatever happens with Hamza Chmaev and, and Leon Edwards, hopefully we eventually get that fight soon, considering that they just canceled it. But I don't think anybody's going to dethrone Kamaru Usman outside of Colby Covington, who has a very similar game plan, right? The guy goes out there, puts on a pace, puts out volume, puts on pressure. And we saw it in that fight. It was pretty much 2-2 heading into that fifth round. All the judges were pretty much split on the sc scorecards, and Kamaru Usman pulled away with it. And that just shows you the guy has... He's strong. He he has that wrestling advantage in pretty much all of his fights. Uh, his clinch work is absolutely amazing. And the fact that his cardio is able to hold up for 25 minutes allows him to get away with fighting boringly. Like he's he's just holding guys up against the cage and really getting getting his game going in that aspect. And people can say, oh, it's it's not that impressive. Then why hasn't anybody stopped it? Nobody's going to be able to stop it. Gilbert Burns might have a little bit of a threat if uh, Kamar wants to take this fight to the ground and test the jiu-jitsu of him. But I don't think that's going to be the approach here. Right, I think he's going to push him up against the cage, really start to wear on Gilbert Burns. I have questions regarding Gilbert Burns' cardio, and people can say all they want about, oh, him going 25 minutes with Tyron Woodley. He had zero resistance to deal with it in that fight, so obviously he's going to be able to go 25 minutes there. But with Usman, I think he's just going to put it too much on Burns, wear on him. Then maybe in the fourth and fifth rounds, we start to see him take this fight to the ground and really start to get his ground and pound going a little bit more. A late Kamar Usman finish wouldn't surprise me, but I do think that this could be another quintessential Usman fight where he racks up a bunch of strikes, racks up a bunch of control time, and wins this fight via decision and continues to cement himself as one of the best 170-pounders pounders, uh, 170 pounders out there. I do believe that Burns has some uh, some solid striking. He might even have a bit of an advantage there, especially from the power standpoint. But Kamaru is so good at winning rounds, so good at min winning minutes, and so good at nullifying the game that you bring to the table. And again, he's already gone 200 ra live rounds with this guy in the training room. And uh, people always want to put the uh, put the uh, put it on as a bonus on the burn side of things. Why would it? Why is it not a, a bonus for Usman? He's the, he's the guy that was running the rounds as well too. So just because Burns on for two hundred rounds doesn't mean that Usman can't take anything away from that either, right? 
And last thing I'll say about this fight, I do like the fact that we saw Usman go over to Trevor Whitman when he was looking for another camp. That's another high-level coach who doesn't have a giant roster that he has to look after, like the Sanford MMAs or the ATTs or the Jackson Winks, right? They got like 100 guys in the UFC, whereas Trevor Whitman, what does he got? Like Justin Gaethje, he's got Rose Nami Yunus. Apparently, Eddie Alvarez made the jump over there as well now too. So he's able to get that one-on-one -on -one time with Trevor Whitman, really start to round out his hands, which is what Trevor Whitman's skill set mainly is. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I think we're going to see another improved version of Kamau Usman. Uh, his knees, obviously, that's one thing that's a little bit of an issue that a lot of people want to talk about. But I do think that he's compensating for it with doing other work. Like, this, the main thing that he says he's not able to do is road work. Just go out there, run, and try to cut weight that way. He's able to supplement it with other forms of training. So I'm sure he's good to go. And having a mastermind like Trevor Whitman in your back pocket, I think it only bodes well uh, for him as well, too. So I'll end off on this. I got Kamaru Usman winning this fight via decision. People are going to always make a, a case for the challenger, just like they did with GSP. But I think it's it, it's just Kamaru Usman all day. I got Usman. Don't mind him at that minus 250 range that he's at. And I think he was this fight via decision. Love it. Cody Saftik, who you taking? Yeah, so I don't think the Trevor Whitman effect's going to really have much to play. And uh, Usman actually did this camp for the George Mazadol fight with Trevor Whitman as well. And, and if anything, his hands look worse in that fight than they did in the Colby Covington fight. So I don't think that he's suddenly going to come out here and be a fantastic striker. But I, I think that his striking is better volume, better pace, better better action pack than Gilbert Burns. Gilbert Burns is a little flashier. He's got a little more power, a little more substance. But he's a natural 155-pounder. And you've seen him fight at 155 to mix results was never the most in-shape 55 or was never the biggest 55 or but did struggle to make weight. And then coming up to 170, I mean, he's been he's been gifted kind of like a, an easier road, so to speak. He's fought Alexei Konchenko. He's fought Gunnar Nelson. He's fought guys that are not in the top 15 of the sport. And yet that's good enough to get him into a title fight position. The win over Tyron Woodley, th there's nothing that you can take out of that. Tyron Woodley's not even a top 15 guy in the UFC at this point. Um you know, I, I just don't it, to put things into realistic. This is just this is just my take. Everyone's got their own opinion on it, right? But the number one guy in the world, Uzma, we all know that, right? The number two guy in the world is not Burns; it's Covington, right? The number right. three guy in the world, Stephen Thompson. The number four guy in the world is Leon Edwards. The number five guy in the world is George Masvidal. The number six guy in the world is Michael Chiesa. And by the way, Burns versus Chiesa, you might be surprised about that one. Vincente Ooh. Luque, I picked Vincente Luque over Gilbert Burns. And by the Ooh. way, he's going to kill Tyron Woodley. Um. In my personal opinion, Gilbert Burns is probably the, the number seven or eighth guy in the division. But everybody else is tied up. Lean, no one wants to fight Edwards. We can't sell a fight. Uh, Woodley's gone. Colby Covington's got some injuries. Kamzat Chemayev, who I didn't even list there, but he also probably beats Gilbert Burns. we we got to see a little more of him before we can make claims like that. But what I'm saying is you, you've got definitively the best welterweight in Kamaru Usman versus not a guy that's even a top five guy. He's just a guy that is, hey, we need to sell pay-per-views. We need to fill cards. This is an absolute porous card, top to bottom, not looking good. And we're going to give you a title fight. And it's not even the number one and two guy in the world. It's not even the number one and three guy in the world. It's not even the number one and four guy in the world. It's like the number one versus the number seventh guy in the world. So where's Burns' key to victory? The submission, right? He's submitted one guy in the last five years in MMA. So I don't see the submission. While he's gonna have to outwork Usman, nobody works out Usman. And last but not least, right? People people want to hate on Usman because he's boring, right? He's he's Marty Snoozman, right? I mean, he's Marty from Nebraska. Oh, this guy's boring. Oh, this guy thirty percent. Oh, this guy with the foot stomps. Okay, but here's the thing, right? Who's the greatest welterweight of all time? George St. Pierre. And everybody loved to complain that George super boring. Before K Khabib's recent like run of quick finishes, he was a decision guy. He would take you down, dominate you. Try and do the decision. Everyone said he was boring. Everyone used to say Colby Covington was boring. And most of all, right, I personally, the, the most boring fighter currently on the UFC roster is John Jones. His fights are watching paint dry. They're awful, right? The days of fighting Alexander Gustafson tooth and nail or, you know, the DC, the second DC fight was pretty entertaining. Those days are gone, man. Now it's just like rinse and repeat bullshit. It's not, not entertaining. It's domination. It's winning. He goes out there and he wins. It's not about taking these unnecessary risks. It's about just winning how you know how to win. Usman knows how to win. He's got high ring IQ. He is 33 years old, but he knows Burns. Burns knows him, sure, but who's that going to benefit? It's going to benefit Usman, who it's easier to prepare for 
you know, I know his go-to submissions. This is what he likes to set up. We've, we've, we've rest, we've gone 200 times together. I know that's his go-to submission. Flip side to the burns. It's like, I know what he wants to do. He wants to take me down and, and, and you know, use his, his strength and his size and grime. It's like, well, can you do anything about that? It's like, no, no, you're not, you're not going to suddenly become a better wrestler than him. You're not suddenly going to be physically stronger than him. And burns has lackluster uh, um, cardio. You haven't really seen it against some of these lower level guys, maybe outside of the Kinchenko fight, but like, traditionally the longer these fights goes he typically does tire he doesn't tire against woodley because woodley's thrown effectively negative punches through 20 minutes in the fight right so it, there's no pace for it to tire burns but like uzman puts a pace and so that's why i think he's gonna break him down uh i like this fight i like uzman i like uzman for sure because they're friends i'd say uzman by decision he's a decision machine he doesn't mind being a boring type fighter. Even in the Masvidal fight, when he did get rocked a little bit, he just reverts to his wrestling, reverts to his cage control, reverts to just, you know, out grappling you and securing the victory. And so worst case scenario, Burns does land something on him. I think Usman will just, you know, revert back to that wrestling and get the job done. And so, uh, yeah, yeah. If he was really motivated and he was, Gilbert Burns like borrowed his lawnmower and never returned it. And he was just like, Man, I'm mad at this guy. I, I can see Usman taking him out late four, late late in the fourth, late in the fifth. You know, maybe not like a Colby Covington esque performance because he was mad at Colby. He's getting he had a hatred for Colby. But one of those performances where you just hit a guy so many times that he's tired and his mouth's open and he's bleeding and it's late and you you break him. Could he break Gilbert Burns? Yes. But that friend factor is kind of in the back of my head that I think he'll just do what he normally does and that's secure the decision victory. Sounds good to me, Guru. Hit us with that hot fire. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I'm going to give Gilbert Burns a little bit more credit than you guys. I think early on he's going to be pretty dangerous. I mean, he has that left hook that, uh, I mean, it knocked out Damian Maya. I mean, Damian Maya's only been knocked out one one other time in his whole career. So he is getting older. But, I mean, you, you have to give him some credit for that. And he's knocked down quite a few people with that check left hook. And that's something that Kamara has to be careful with because you have seen him you know, in the fights with Colby Covington and the fight uh, with George Mazda a little bit. I mean, when he's exchanging in the pocket, he does get clipped a little bit. And I don't think those guys have the same type of punching power that Gilbert Burns has. But Gilbert Burns, to me, is kind of basic. He's like a, you know, pocket boxer. He's gotten better with his uh, kicking game a lot. I mean, you have to give Henry Hooft a lot of credit with both these guys because they're both grapplers. And I mean, now they both have pretty competent striking games. And, you know, I do think that, you know, the low calf kick and the body kicks from Gilbert Burns have, you know, helped him win a lot of these fights. But with Usman, I mean, Usman's really good at catching the kicks. And I think he's going to be able to probably negate that. I don't think Burns is going to want to throw as many of those. And uh, I, I think early on, like I said, Burns is going to be live if he can get on the inside and force exchanges. Because, I mean, when you look at Usman, even against George Mazdal, I think he was only like uh, 4 of 16 or 5 of 16 on takedowns. He did have a lot of uh, control time, but I don't necessarily see him just taking down Gilbert Burns real easily and controlling him on the mat. I think that it's either going to be uh, him controlling the clinch or they're going to be striking more often than not. And uh, I feel like early on Burns is going to be live, like I've been saying. But as the fight goes on, I mean, Usman, to me, he has underrated striking. I mean, I think he has one of the best jabs in the UFC, man. I mean, his jab is really good. Like, if you watch the fight against Mazadog, the fight against Colby Covington, I mean, he destroyed both those guys with the jab. He has the really good uh, front kicks to the body. And I just feel like uh, he's going to be the more durable guy. He's obviously the lot bigger guy, and he's going to have the cardio advantage. So, if, as long as he doesn't get finished, which I think is unlikely in these first two rounds, I just see him, you know, wearing on Kamara or wearing on Burns and uh, just taking it down the stretch. But I could see it being closer. I could see Burns even winning, you know, maybe two rounds. But I think it could be a uh, 49-46 for uh, Usman more than likely. I'm with you guys. I got Usman in this one, you know. Um I, Guru, you brought up the point, man. Burns might be getting a little bit disrespected. I think he will be dangerous early on, but I mean, Burns, we're talking about a guy, you know, look at the KOs, which don't get me wrong, they're impressive, but you know, big looping shots. I mean, the guy can crack, that's for sure. Big time power. Uh, you know, some good subs, but Cody, you brought up the point, man. It's been a minute. Uh, and we're talking at going up against a guy in Kamaru Usman who's never been knocked out. The one fight he lost, which was his second pro fight years ago, you know, he got his back taken standing and, you know, a guy locked in an RNC. I mean, is there a possibility that could happen here? Yeah. Has Burns probably tapped out Usman in training? Man, I'd hope so. They've been training partners for years. Uh, I, I just think Usman's the better guy here. Uh, the looping shots of Burns, I, I just think Usman's, you know, the straighter striker. I think he's the better striker. I think he's the better grappler. I think he's the bigger man. I think he's stronger. 
I think he takes Burns down. I don't think Burns takes Usman down. Nobody else has done it yet. Um, maybe Burns does have some some secret. And I feel like a lot of people who are backing Burns, it's it does. It just comes down to the fact that, you know, these guys know each other. These guys have trained together. I mean, Kamaru Usman's been a been a corner man for, for Gilbert Burns in fights. I mean, these guys really know each other uh, beyond even the average training partner, you know. But at the same time, man, when it just comes down to it, Kamaru Usman is a dominant champion. I don't think uh, I don't think Burns makes this fight even as close as Colby Covington, who, man, I got to give credit to. That was a very close fight until it got stopped. But uh, for my money, man, Kamaru Usman is the best, the best welterweight in the world. Burns could win this fight, but at the same time, man, I don't think this is the guy. I don't think Usman's reign is over. I got Usman in this one. I think he probably gets it done by decision like he usually does. So there you go, folks. We've done it. UFC 258. We're wrapping it up. I'm your host, Bleed. Hit that thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button. And thank you guys so much for watching. I'm going to throw it around the horn before we get out of here. MMA Prediction Guru, tell them where to find you. Yeah, man. Good show for sure. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming through. We had about 500 people in here, so that was awesome. And, yeah, you can find me at MMA Prediction Guru on uh, YouTube if you want to check out my channel, things like that. And then uh, at Prediction MMA on Twitter, uh, MMA Prediction Guru on Instagram. If you want to hit me up uh, in the DM, you know, talk about fights, I'll definitely uh, be down. And, uh, yeah, guys, glad to be back for this card. No doubt. We're glad to have you back, Guru. M-M-A-L-O-T-N. Tell them where to find you. Yeah, at M-M-A-L-O-T-N on Twitter, M-M-A-L-O-T-N on the IG, M-M-A-L-O-T-N on the YouTubes as well. Uh, I usually drop my podcast every Monday of Fight Week just to give you guys an early look. Then again, once it comes to Fight Day, it's probably not the same card, but it doesn't matter. At least you guys get a nice early look. Appreciate uh, doing the show with you guys every Friday as well. Obviously, Thursdays, you guys can catch me and Cody doing the propping you up show at 8 p.m. Eastern. So, was, so the next time you guys see me, we'll be on that stream. Great to have the band back together again. I thought we got some great insights. I wish we were a little bit more against each other on some of these picks but this is a tough card man this is an absolutely very very tough card uh glad hope we did uh, the best of our uh best job that we could to give you guys uh different perspectives on these fights but man a, a very very tough card hope people are able to cash tickets tomorrow and i'm looking forward to watching the fights well, I tell you what, Locke, when we're all on the same side, that usually means some good shits are coming. So, all right, Cody, let them know where to find you. Yeah, we had a solid turnout in the, in the comment section tonight. Saw solid viewership all around him. And I guess it is a pay-per-view. It's such a, such a weak pay-per-view. So I'm hoping, fingers crossed, nothing else falls off. Even today, someone was like, Green's off. I was like, yeah, the Gabe Green fight wasn't that good anyways. And they're like, no, Bobby Green. I was like, Bobby Green, no! <laughs> I feel the same way now. Hopefully the, the fights that we do still have are intact. Because otherwise the UFC is going to have to spice it up as a pay-per-view. What I'd like to see is Usman versus Gilbert Burns. And then him and Herbert Burns get to alternate rounds <laughs> one at a time. And I still got Usman beating them both by decision at the same time. Um, yeah, good times all around. Thanks for the odd squad getting together again. And yeah, hopefully we can turn what seems to be some iffy lackluster fights into a, a profitable night. That's fun for everybody. So good luck, and uh, thanks for joining us again tonight. If you need anything, on Twitter, at CJ Saptic. Absolutely. I'm Bleed. You can find me on my channel here on YouTube, Just Bleed MMA, and all the social medias, baby. Best of luck. Cash those tickets. Thank you guys for watching. Same time, same place. We will catch you next week. We 